So hello all my dearest students of South India. I hope you all are doing good and I hope you all are studying well for your upcoming exams. Okay. So now we are, I am coming towards my last commitment which I have made to you all and that is the discussion of past papers. So here today we are going to do the discussion of last five past papers which are relevant for your exams for May 23 as well as for your November 23 exams in full English, especially dedicated to my South India students. Okay. So that you guys should not be felt left over. So, without wasting any further time, the very first question over here is based on the computation of total income and tax payable as per the regular provision, not as per MAT, not as per 115 BAA. Okay. So, this is not as per MAT, not as per 115 BAA, as per the regular provision. So, let's start. Assess is a manufacturing company. So, accordingly, you can have some special provision applicable. The net profit is 75 lakhs. The very first adjustment is a very good adjustment till last year, that is till 21-22. The company used to include the interest as a part of their stock. Interest was a part of the cost of stock. But from financial year 22-23, they have removed that, which should not be part of cost. Okay, as per the accounting standard also, interest cannot be part of what the stock. Interest has to be removed from the stock. So in the current year, the company has done properly. And the company has also decreased the profit because of that. Whatever profit was to be adjusted, the company has done that. Now, if everything is done by the company properly, we don't have to do any adjustment. And that is the reason for this first adjustment we are not going to give any effect over here okay the next question is the company has made a provision for graduate of five lakhs now we all know that provision for payment of graduate is disallowed under the income tax law whatever is the provision is not allowed not allowed not allowed yes so this five lakhs will be disallowed yes as per 48 7 it is disallowed but whenever it will be paid that is one lakh twenty thousand is paid that will be allowed as reduction. So the ultimate effect of this particular adjustment would be add 5 lakh less 1 lakh 20,000. Next one, the company has purchased some one-time license fees, uh, franchise fees, paid some one-time franchise fees. Now that is what, that is your intangible asset. So you have to add back this 20 lakhs and you will remove 25% depreciation on the same and you will claim full depreciation because the asset is used for more than 180 days. Next, there is some loss, cash loss by theft uh, and the company has not insured that particular cash. Okay, so cash loss by theft, cash loss by fire, etc. All these things are revenue losses, trading losses which will be allowed as deduction as per the Supreme Court judgment of Badri Das Daga versus CIT. Therefore, this will be allowed as deduction. The next one is a very, very, very intelligent adjustment. You are making some payment of 3 lakh rupees royalty to non-resident. Now, you have deducted the tax, but you have not deposited the tax till the due date of filing of return. So now, this expenditure will be disallowed 100%. It is that simple as that. Now, they have given you some information to confuse you. Like, the other person, that is the payee, has filed the return. The payee has included this 3 lakh rupees in the income. But the payee is claiming refund on that. Okay, there are two reasons because of which I cannot give you the deduction of this 3 lakh rupees. First of all, do you remember that? If the payer has not deducted, payer has not paid, but the payee has included that income, has paid the tax and has filed the return, then the payer will be deemed to be what? Not assessing default. Payer is it, it is deemed that the payer has deducted and the payer has paid. Do you remember that? There is some proviso like this in the income tax law. But that is applicable only if the other person pays the tax. Now, in this question, the other person does not pay the tax. He is claiming a refund. So, that is the first reason because of which I will not, dis I will not allow the expenditure. Because there are three conditions that the payee has to do. He has to file the return. Yes, he has filed. He has to include the income. He has, in he has included it. But apart from that, he also has to pay the tax. Now, he is claiming refund. He is not paying tax. Therefore, in that case, I will not get the deduction. This is the first reason because of which I will not get the deduction. The second reason because of which I will not get the deduction is as follows. Listen carefully. The second reason is very, very simple. That it is deemed that it is deducted in the month of what? In the month of July. So, if it is deducted in the month of July 2023, it will be allowed in the next year, not in the current year. In any case, in the current year, it will be disallowed, disallowed, disallowed. Okay. Next one. Next one is a very routine adjustment. You are selling some plot of land to your 100% holding subsidiary. Okay. So, that is exempt under income tax law. So, that is not subject to tax. Okay. That is exempt under income tax law. Next one. You are having some 16% shares in the private company. Private company means a closely held company. So if any person has a 16, 10% or more shareholding in a private company, that is in a closely held company. And if that company gives a loan to you, then that becomes deemed dividend. But the deemed dividend cannot be more than the accumulated reserve. Therefore, the loan is 2 lakhs and the accumulated reserve is 5 lakh. Therefore, the deemed dividend will be only 2 lakh under 222E. Okay. Next is a very important adjustment. Once again, the company has purchased a new motor car. See the date. Focus on date on 23rd of August 2019. So, if anybody has purchased a motor car between 23rd of August 2019 to 31st of March 2020 and put to use the vehicle in that period, then that person is eligible for 15% extra depreciation. So, you'll be eligible for 15% extra. It means on in the current year. In the current year on 12 lakh 80,000 WDV, you are going to get depreciation of 30% instead of 15%. Be very careful. Okay. Now, this depreciation is not taken in the above, above calculation. So, you have to reduce that depreciation from your PNL. Next one is a question on 80 JJAA. Now, 80 JJAA is applicable if the strength of the employee increases as compared to the last year. Now, in the last year, the employees were 480. In the current year, the employees are 530. Is the strength increase? Yes, it is increased. Because the strength is increased, you are eligible for 80 JJAA. Otherwise, you would have not got 80 JJAA. Now, how many additional employees you have hired? You have hired 120 additional employees for how many months for nine months and you are paying 15,000 rupees emolument to them that is all fine up to 25,000 it is allowed and that will be subject to 30% what 30% deduction okay now one last thing which is given over here the tax 
rate of the company will become 30 percent why because the turnover of last to last year is exceeding 400 crore therefore the tax rate will come to how much 30 percent will it be subject to surcharge no surcharge surcharge etc will not be applied because the total income is less than what 50 lakh rupees check it please sorry not 50 lakhs one crore for a company the surcharge limit is one crore so now let's move on to the next question the question number two in this there are two parts the first part is absolutely same as what we have to done earlier in mtp you can check it this is the same question we have done earlier so i am not repeating the same question once again it is same with the amounts also the amounts are also same everything is same you can check over there in the mtp okay now the second question is a very 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 intelligent and a different kind of question which has been asked by ici in this particular paper now let me tell you what exactly is there in this particular question first of all there is a company vionia inc which is there in japan it's a non-resident it's a foreign company which is also a non resident how you can say non resident sir it is incorporated outside india is it not a resident because of poem also no it is not resident because of poem also they are holding some meetings in india no doubt but those meetings are not in relation to what day to day business and management it is not in relation to your control and management in india it is in relation to the sale of some part of the company in india now the sale of some part of the company in india does not amount to poem it does not amount to what the control of uh, actual business or management in india okay and on behalf of that we have we have seen that in particular thing in the circular of poem that if a company is engaged in sale of a set or amalgamation or demerger then that does not amount to what that does not amount to what a poem it is not something where you are taking key management and commercial decisions it is a decision in respect of what sale of the business which cannot be called as key management and commercial de uh, decisions for your day-to-day -day business therefore the company is a non-resident that is for sure now you have to answer the entire question based on non-resident now no no be very careful every part is very important especially the first two parts are absolutely important now this is the foreign company vioni inc now this vioni inc is having earning some dividend from another foreign company so one foreign company is giving dividend to another foreign company and the second foreign company which is giving the dividend is having 70% of its total assets in India no doubt 70% of its total assets in India therefore the shares of Miami INC derive its value substantially from the asset located in India now this entire provision is this entire question is based on what Vodafone case law so this company Miami INC is deriving its value substantially from asset located in India so will the income be will the dividend be taxable in the hands of Vioni INC no 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 that Vodafone case law amendment came only for capital gain taxation it did not came for dividend taxation do you remember that if CGP gives dividend to what to HTIL then that dividend is not taxable it is exempt as per a CBDT circular which was issued in 2015 and therefore this dividend will also be what exempt 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 Second question, this Vioni INC is giving some technical services to the government of India and government of India is making the payment but government of India is using that technical services not in India but in Nepal. Will that technical services be taxable in India? The answer is yes, yes, yes. Now you will have a doubt. Sir, how it can be taxable? The Vioni INC is giving us uh, services and, and the government is using that services not in India. They are using outside India. It doesn't matter. The services should be used in India. It should not be used outside India. That logic is applicable for resident payers. It is not applicable for government. So in case of government, if a technical service is taken or royalty is taken or money is borrowed, and if it is used outside India also, 915, 916 and 917 is applicable in case of a government. Therefore, here the income will be taxable in the hands of what? In the hands of the foreign company. Okay. Next, 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 next. This is a very simple one. There is a unit located in IFSC who has taken some loan from Vioni INC and Vioni and IFSC unit is making the payment of the low interest to the Vioni INC. Now, this interest is exempt under section 1015 on or after 1st September 2019. Okay. You can check the provisions of 115A. We have written below that, that if an IFSC unit pays interest to a foreign company or non-resident then that is exempt 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 and the last one is a very simple one that is based on grandfathering that you can go we have done a lot of questions on grandfathering whenever the date 31st jan 2018 will come now it means there is a question on what grandfathering you have to compute your cost of acquisition accordingly okay and compute capital gains under 112a now in this question <coughs> You are only supposed to compute the total income, that's it. You are not supposed to compute any tax liability. The next question is based on a charitable trust. There is a charitable trust which is registered under 2LAB and it follows accrual system. Now, whichever system it wants to follow, let him follow. But the payment, the deduction will be allowed only on payment basis from Finance Act 2022. Do you remember that? There is an amendment made by Finance Act 2022 which says that the deduction of application will be allowed only on payment basis not on accrual basis okay you can book your revenue on accrual basis there is no harm in that but the deduction will be allowed on what payment basis payment basis payment basis otherwise it will not be allowed so let's compute the income statement how they compute the income first all the incomes less 15 percent exemption then all the application then total income will come and then we'll apply the tax okay now the very first thing over here is 24 lakh 41 thousand you have received some money from students so you put that particular thing in your income statement the second thing is you are receiving some donations now, in that donation, 185 is voluntary anonymous donation. So, for anonymous donation, section 115 BBC will be applicable, separate treatment will be done. 335,000 is a normal donation, you can add to your income statement. Now, for anonymous donation, what will happen? 185 is your anonymous donation, you will get exemption under 115 BBC at the rate of 1 lakh or 5% of donation, whichever is higher. Therefore, higher is coming to 1 lakh. Therefore, 85,000 
will be taxable at 30 percent okay now what about this donation which is exempt i have told you in the class also this donation which is exempt now that is not going to be 100 percent exempt that you have to add in the normal income statement so i am the, i am adding that donation in the normal income statement and then i am claiming 15 percent exemption and then i can apply that money and take further exemption but the donation which is taxable at 30 percent it is subject to flat 30 percent taxation it is not subject to any deductions under the income tax law so you have to make two bifurcation of that 1 lakh 85 whatever is the taxable donation that will be subject to 30 percent tax and what is the exempt donation you have to add to the income statement about 15 percent okay and then you can claim 15 percent exemption on that next one is uh you have received some dividend from indian companies yes you have to add that to the income statement and then take 15 percent then 2 lakh 85 income from mutual fund add to the income statement then take 15 percent agriculture income is exempt for even trust section 10 one is exempt for trust okay don't worry now the trust is accumulating some money for the next four years yes you can claim exemption under section 11 subsection 2 the trust is making payment to one of the trustees as rent okay you can make the payment to trustees as rent. There is no harm in that. But don't pay excess. So you are not paying excess. In fact, you are paying less only. The fair market value is two lakh fifty. You are paying only one forty seven. So it's all fine. So one forty seven you can claim as a deduction. Okay. Then you are making payment to some teachers. Okay. So that will also be allowed as deduction. Then other expenses are there. That also can be claimed as deduction. But assume that other expenses are paid, paid, paid because it is not mentioned whether it is paid or accrued. If it is not paid, then it is not allowed from finance act two thousand twenty two. You have to pay that other expense. Okay. Now once you do this, you will get the total income as nine lakh fifty four. Now you have to make two bifurcation of that. Out of nine lakh fifty four. 85,000 will be subject to 30% tax and the balance amount 869, 850. So 954, two bifurcation, 85,000, 30% tax, balance 869, 850 will be subject to slab rate. You apply the slab rate and then you apply 30% on 85,000, then you apply 4% says and then you will got what? You will get the amount of tax over here, okay? Now, coming to the next question. Next question is a very routine question of DTAA. I am not much interested in that. There are a few important points which I would like to address you all. The SSC is a resident, SSC is 65 year old and therefore the SSC would be subject to what? The SSC will be subject to what? will be subject to 80 TTB benefit under the income tax law of 50,000 rupees. That is the only important thing which I would like to tell you in this question. Apart from that, it's a routine question. You can check it. Now, the next question is based on TDS where we have to find out whether TDS will be deducted or not. The first question is, there is one company, Maxell Limited, who is engaged in business. They are making some payment to what? As a bank guarantee to a bank. Now, whenever a payment is made to a bank guarantee uh, commission to a bank, TDS is not deducted. There is one CBT circular on that, which says that whenever you make a payment to the bank as a bank guarantee, TDS will not be deducted. You can check the circular if you want below. Okay. Next one. There is one trust by the name called a study card who has paid 98,000 rupees to a non-resident, Mr. Monty, for web-based lecture. Now, whether I should deduct TDS or not. Now, TDS will be deducted under 195 if it is deducted. Now, whether I should deduct or not. Now, there are two views which are taken by ICI. First of all, the web-based lecture which they are providing to us, if it is accrued in India, if it is a normal business, okay? If it is, listen carefully, it's a very important uh, question over here. The web-based lecture which is provided by Mr. Monty, a non-resident, if it is a normal business, then it is not accrued in India. Why? Because for normal business, if it wants to accrue in India, there has to be a permanent establishment or a business connection which is not there. And if it is not accrued, then the payment made to them of 98,000 will not be subject to TDS. Now, the second view which is taken by ICI. Suppose the web-based lecture which is provided by the non-resident. Suppose it is in the form of FTS, fees for technical service. Now, for fees for technical service to accrue, there is no need to have any business connection or place of business or permanent establishment in India. It is accrued just because it is utilized in India. So, in that case, it is accrued. And if it is accrued, you are supposed to deduct TDS under section 195. You can write both the views. You can write either of the view, whatever you want to. Okay. Now, there is one person, Mr. Nitin, who is an individual whose last year's turnover is less than 1 crore rupees. Therefore, 194C will not be applicable to him. Okay. But he has paid 65 lakhs to repair his office. Therefore, can to a resident. He is making the payment to a resident. So, 194C cannot be applicable because for 194C to be made applicable to an individual and HUF, last year turnover has to be greater than 1 crore rupees. Okay. Now, that is not happening. So, 194M will apply because the payment is made to resident and it is more than 50 lakhs. Therefore, 194M will apply 65 lakhs into 5%. Okay. Next question. You are making some payment to... Airport Authority of India, you are an airline company, you are making some payment to Airport Authority of India in the form of landing and parking charges. So, whatever payment you make to Airport Authority of India in the form of landing and parking charges will be subject to TDS under 194C and not 194IE. It is not 194I, 194C. It is said by Supreme Court in the case of Japan Airlines in 2015. Therefore, this will be subject to 2%. Why? Because the Airport Authority of India is a company, actually. It is not individual or HUM. Therefore, you will deduct 2% TDS over here, okay? Now, the next question is very important. I am myself saying it's very important because we have, but we have done this question a lot of times. We have done this question at least twice in the RTPs and mock tests. So, I am not repeating this question, but it is an important question. They have been asking this question again and again and again and again. It is an important one, but we have done it earlier. So, that is the reason I am not doing it once again. Okay. Question number 5, I am going to. Question number 5, which is based on case laws. The first case law is something which we have done at least two times earlier, which is of Lakshman Das Khandelwal. What is this case law all about? Do you remember that? That 292BB cannot be attracted if the notice is not issued by the department. For 292BB to attract, the notice has to be issued by the department. Without issue of notice, 292BB cannot be attracted. Check that is the case law which is mentioned over here. 
Now the next case law is High Court has passed some order and now High Court has made some mistake in the order. Now can High Court recall its own order and rectify the apparent mistake? Why not? Definitely High Court can recall its order, rectify its apparent mistake in some circumstances. In some circumstances that you can go through in the solution, I don't have that much time to speak about each and every circumstance over here. Anyways, it's not a very important case law. Once, in, once upon a time it had to ask and they have asked. Moral of the story is very simple. If the High Court wants to rectify its apparent mistake, they can recall the order and it can rectify the apparent mistake in some circumstances. Okay. Next one is a very important case law which we have done it in class a lot of time. I have said you this a lot of time that when you sell a asset from block, when you sell a block of asset, the gain is always short term. But the asset may be short term, may be long term. Asset is not always short term. Therefore, there is a building which is purchased by SSE in 2009, which is a business building and the SSE is selling that building in 2019. Okay. In 2019, they are selling the building. So, after 10 years, they are selling the building. Therefore, the building is long term now the gain will always be long term uh, the gain sorry the gain will always be short term because the building is a part of block whether the assessee can claim 54 ec yes 54 ec says that the asset should be long term the gain should be long term it is not said by 54 ec the gain can be short term the gain can be long term 54 ec is not interested in that 54 ec is only interested in the nature of asset if the asset is long term 54 ec is available the gain is short term it doesn't matter 54 ec can be claimed in this particular case okay next one is a question on cooperative society. There is a cooperative society who is giving credit to its members. Therefore, it is eligible for ATP deductions. It is a deduction. It is not an exemption. Be very careful. First of all, it is making some deposit to other cooperative society that is eligible for deduction under ATP. If a cooperative society gives loan to other cooperative society and earns interest, that is deductible under ATP. So, you can claim this deduction under ATP. Next, if a cooperative society is receiving some interest from members, then that is also eligible for deduction under ATP. Next, the cooperative society is receiving rent. So, rent of 36,000 into 12 minus what? 30% deduction. It is taxable. That is not exempt. Okay. Now, in Income from agency business that is also taxable that is not exempt against the agency business you can claim an expense of 1 lakh 24,000 you can check over here next the cooperative society is also earning interest received from deposit of idle fund members yes this 2 lakh 4,000 will also be eligible for what eligible because it is also by giving idle funds to members they are earning some interest that is also subject to ATP deduction and last but not least you can claim what 98,000 rupees loss deduction at the end of the uh, at the end of the calculation you can claim that what is the tax payable you have to compute tax as per the general provisions plus apart from that the cooperative society will also get 50,000 rupees standard deduction why because the cooperative society is a normal cooperative society if this cooperative society would have been a, a consumer cooperative society then they would have got deduction of 1 lakh but this is a normal cooperative society therefore they will get deduction of 50,000 rupees you will compute tax as per the normal provision not as per 115 BAD I don't know why institute has not computed tax as per 115 BAD they have computed only as per the normal provision okay maybe at that time when this question was asked at that time 115 BAD was not there but you compute as per normal provision now what is the normal tax rate for cooperative society up to total income 10,000, 10%. About 10,000, up to 20,000, 20%. And about 20,000, it is 30%. When surcharge will be imposed, if the income is more than 1 crore and up to 10 crore, surcharge is 7%. And if the income is more than 10 crore, surcharge will be 12%. Okay, just like a domestic company. You can check it, please. So, this is what this question is all about. Now, <coughs> one last question is over here. Let's go through that question also. And that is question number 6 in this paper. Then we'll move on to the next paper. There was an SSE who received a draft order from the assessing officer as per 144C. 144C is what? 144C is applicable to eligible SSEs who are either foreign companies or non-resident or in whose case TPO has passed a prejudicial order. So, in that case, the assessing officer has to give a draft order. After that draft order is received, the SSE has two options. Either to accept the draft order or to object the draft order to the dispute resolution panel. Now, the SSE does not want to object. SSE is saying that I don't want to object. I want to directly appeal to the CIT appeal later on. He can do so. Nobody can stop him. So, that's what the question is. The assessee does not want to object to DRP. It wants to directly appeal to CIT appeal. Can he do so? Yes. Nobody can stop him. Whenever the DRPs, uh, whenever the AO's draft order will come, accept that order. The AO will pass the final order, take the final assessment order and then you can appeal to CIT appeal within 30 days. Okay, that is allowed. There is no harm in that. Next one is a theory question. The assessing officer has initiated a penalty proceeding under 270A. The assessing officer has also launched prosecution against the SSE. The assessing officer has done both the things. Now, the assessee wants immunity from this. Now, what are the conditions? He has to follow a few things. Then his penalty will be immune and his prosecution will be immune under 270AA. What are the things that he is supposed to do? The very first thing that he is supposed to do, he has to make an application to the assessing officer within one month from the end of the month in which the order is received. He has to make an application. Then within 30 days of the receipt of notice of demand, he has to pay tax and interest. Okay. And then the third thing which he has to do, he should not appeal against the assessment order. He should not appeal against the assessment order. If he does three th these three things, his penalty will be, his penalty may be immune by the assessing officer under 270AA. Okay. One more thing that he has to do, he has to keep it in mind that only the 50% penalty will be immune over here. 200% penalty is not immune over here. That is only a case of normal under reporting penalty is immune. Misreporting cases are not immune over here. Check it please. Next question is exactly similar to what we have done earlier also. 
we have done this question a lot of times here but still once more i will tell you this question for the very last time after this it comes i am not going to be speaking on that identical limited is an indian company and horizon russia is a foreign company and both of them are associate enterprise how they are associate enterprise because one holds 35 percent in another on that note both of them are associate enterprise now now uh, the identica is giving some services to what horizon the total cost is 2 lakh 25 000. this is step one now what is the gp margin to the third party this is the question on cost plus method in cost plus method what are you supposed to find out what what is the cost which is uh, in case of service which is given to associate enterprise that is step one the cost in case of service given to associate enterprise is 2 lakh 25 thousand rupees second step is you have to find out the arms length gp what is the gp margin on cost which is given to third party and that is 50 percent which is given in the question and now you have to adjust the margin okay now for that you need to find out the functional differences there are four functional differences over here which has been asking again and again by the ICI. the first one is when identica gives services to horizon horizon also give us some services so if i give you some services and you also give me some services then i should charge you more profit or less profit i am giving you some services you are also giving me some services free of cost then i should charge you more profit or less profit i should charge you less profit now therefore how much is the service which you are providing to me it is normal 18 percent of normal gp 18 percent of normal gp will come to nine percent therefore i should charge you nine percent less now therefore i should reduce nine percent from fifty percent okay second i am providing you services that is i am providing services to horizon and I am giving you discount. But to third party, I am not giving discount. So if I am giving you discount, associated enterprise, I am giving discount, then the charge and the profits have to be lower. Now, accordingly, how much lower it has to be? It is 10% of normal GP. 10% of normal GP is 5%. So there, again, I have to reduce 5%. The third one is, when I give you services, when I give you services, there is no risk. There is no risk. So if when I give you services, there is no risk. When I give the services to a third party, there is a lot of risk. So when I give the services to a third, third party, there is a lot of risk. The profit has to be higher there. And in your case, there is no risk. The profit has to be lower. So that much I have to reduce again. Therefore, again, here it is how much? 12% of normal GP. 12% of normal GP will come to 6%. So the first, second and third point will be reduced from 50%. And the fourth point is what? I give you one month credit. I give credit to Horizon. That credit I don't give to my third party. Uh, if I give credit to a social enterprise, I should charge less price or more price i should charge more price so here you are not going to reduce you are going to add back okay so here you are going to add back two percent of normal gp two percent normal gp come to one percent now if i do all these things three three reductions one addition the arms length gp comes to 31 percent and therefore this 31 percent will be added to the cost of the asset and then you will get the arms length price of your calculation and then accordingly you can find the differential amount how much was actual price and how much is your arms length gp arms length price differential amount has to be added back to your income okay so let's go through it and then we'll move on with the next question so let's move on to the next paper that is July 2021. The very first question over here again would be obviously on total income. We have to suppose to compute total income. Ignore MAT. Ignore 115 BAA. Okay. So let's see one by one all the adjustments. The SSC is a manufacturer. So accordingly you can have some special provisions applicable in your case. First of all add depreciation. Second one is you are giving some donation to a research institution. Uh, scientific research. It is allowed as a deduction under section 3511. 50 lakhs. So it is already debited. It is already debited. So ignore that. And one very important note is given in the last line, which says that uh, the approval of the research institution was withdrawn after you gave the donation. So will it affect your donation? The answer is no. Suppose if I give you a donation today, yeah, today you are approved. And if tomorrow your approval is withdrawn, my donation will not be denied. It will be allowed to you. Don't worry about it. Okay. Next one is a very important adjustment whereby you have taken a loan from a financial institution that is NBFC on 1st of May 2022. Therefore, your total interest on 350 lakhs will come to 350 lakhs into 8% for 11 months. That will come to 25.67. Now, out of this loan, the sum portion was used for what machinery? Some portion was used for machinery, okay? Now, not some portion. In fact, entire portion was used for machinery only. Now, machinery was put to use on 1st of Feb. So, on 1st of Feb, you have put the machinery on use. You can see over here. So, from May till 31st Jan, whatever interest is that, you have to capitalize that much interest. So, 25.67, you have for 9 months interest, you have to capitalize, 9 months interest will come to how much? 21 crore, you have to capitalize. What about the remaining one? The remaining one should be allowed as a revenue expenditure, but that will also not be allowed. Why? Because that is also not paid, that is outstanding and it will not be allowed because section 43B will disallow that particular expenditure. So, what is the ultimate treatment? 25.67 what is the ultimate treatment of that 21 crore will be capitalized to the cost of asset and 4.6 crore will be disallowed entire 25.6 crore 67 will not be allowed as a revenue expenditure to you 21 crore will be capitalized and 4.67 will be considered as what as your as your disallowance because of 43b next you have paid some salary of 100 lakhs to foreign technicians for installation of machinery now this is also should be added to the actual cost of the asset so add this 100 crore to the cost of asset next you are incurring some 35 lakhs rupees on general expenses to bring water in your factory that is allowed that is a normal revenue expenditure there is nothing wrong in that next you are giving donation of 10 lakhs to a political party so first add back in pgbp and then you can take the deduction in atgb subject to a condition that the payment was not made in cash if the payment is made in cash then it is not allowed they have not given the whether the payment is made in cash or whether the payment 
payment is made in kind. They have not given that. Okay. Next one is a very important adjustment. You have purchased some 25 lakh rupees coal in your business, but you don't have invoice for that. You don't have an invoice for the purchase of the coal, but you have some indirect evidences like you have indirect evidences like goods invert report. You have you also have the payment details. Auditor has also given an adverse remark against you that, that this is the for this particular transaction invoice is not there. Now there are two views which are possible. If you can satisfy to the assessing officer, the assessing officer will give you the deduction. If you cannot satisfy to the assessing officer, Assessing officer will not give you the reduction. Both the answers are correct over here. Okay. Next is also very, very, very important and tricky adjustment. You have made a sale of 20 lakh rupees to a person. Okay. Now, after one or two years, you have write off out of that 20 lakhs, 10 lakhs. So now the remaining amount receivable is only 10 lakhs. Okay. 10 lakh is receivable. Now, that other person from whom 10 lakh is receivable now, because 10 lakh is already written off. Now, from whom 10 lakh is receivable, that person is died. He expired. Now, we could only collect 7 lakh from him to final settlement okay so and remaining 3 lakh is now absolutely bad debts now what should i do now this 10 lakh is already credited to the pnl okay so you have again credited that to pnl this 7 lakh which is recovered now you have again credited that to pnl now when you sold the goods of 20 lakh rupees have you credited 20 lakhs to the pnl yes after that 10 lakhs become bad debts so 10 lakhs you took the deduction but still the other 10 lakh is credited to the pnl you have paid tax on that now if you are recovering something out of that 10 lakhs you cannot again credit that to pnl now. so you have credited that again to the pnl so first remove this 7 lakhs because it is already included in the sale earlier and then remaining 3 lakh which is absolutely not possible to recover because 7 lakh is final settlement so remaining 3 lakh you can claim as a bad debts okay now there are some opening wdvs which are given you have to claim depreciation on that factory building 10 percent computer 40 percent office appliances 15 percent tractors very important these tractors are used within the factory be very careful it will be useful to us in some time 20 lakhs this will be 15 percent okay and plant and machinery 800 lakhs now there are some assets which are purchased during the now you have to see whether it is used for more than 100 days or less than 100 days factory building first november so only half 50 percent computer on first First May, full 40%. Tractor, be very careful. There are two tractors which you are purchasing. One is purchased on June, uh, August. So, you will get full 15% depreciation. Another is purchased in February. So, you will get half per depreciation. That is 7.5. Plus, you will also get additional depreciation on these tractors. Why? Because these tractors are used in factory. Do you remember that? I have told you. Forklift trucks, special, tra special, special cars, special vehicles which are used especially inside the factory will be eligible for deduction of additional depreciation. So, it is eligible for depreciation. Okay. Next, this plant and machinery, 500 lakhs. On that 100 lakhs, installation cost will be added back and 21 lakhs, you have to add back what? The interest cost. Therefore, the actual cost of this plant and machinery will be 621 lakhs. On this 621 lakhs, you are going to compute what? 15%, uh, sorry, 7.5% because it is used for less than 180 days. 7.5% normal depreciation and 10% additional depreciation will also be allowed on this particular thing. Okay. Then, you are incurring some uh, expenses on ISO certificate 10 lakhs. Now, this is not an asset as per the income tax law. Uh, as, per, as per ICDS, it might be as, as per uh, the index, it might be an asset. But as per the income tax law, it is not an asset. And therefore, this a payment wage for ISO, ISO certificate acquiring of ISO certificate, because to tell the quality of the product, you have to make some payment to the ISO people. And therefore, whatever payment you have made, that will be allowed as what? As a revenue expenditure, you can claim deduction on that. Check it, please. And then we'll move on with the next question. We don't have to compute the tax liability over here. So let's go on to the next question. The first question, the very first question over here is based on some amendments now which are made by say, Finance Act 2022 under Section 170 and 170A. So accordingly, you have to go to that amendment and solve this question. This question as of now is not much relevant to us. Okay. Let's go on to the second part of this question. In the second part of this question, a lot of things are happening. There is an assessee, uh, Messrs. A and Company, a partnership firm who has filed the return and his return is selected for scrutiny. Okay. Now, there are two disallowances which are made by the assessing officer. First, he has added 50 lakhs as bad debts. Why? Because the assessee was not able to prove that the debt has become bad. So, is the contention of the assessing officer correct? The answer is no, no, no. Why? Because the assessing assessee is not supposed to prove that the debt has become bad. If he wants to claim deduction under section 3617, he has to do only one thing. That is, he has to write off that debt in the books of accounts. If he write off that debt in the books of accounts, that's it. Nobody can stop him to claim the deduction. It is not necessary to establish the fact that the debt has become bad. You don't have to prove it to anyone. Okay. Therefore, the assessing officer is wrong. The second disallowance which he has made that, he has made disallowances of repairs and maintenance which were booked on an estimate. So, the assessing officer is saying that I am adding back 75 lakhs because I am feeling that this, this repairs and maintenance are on estimated basis. Now, again, there are two views taken by ICI over here. Yeah, that is if the assessee can explain to the assessing officer that this repairs is a current repair. If it is a current repair, then it is allowed. If he is not able to satisfy the assessing officer that it is a current repair, then it will not be allowed. It is as simple as that. Now, the third contention, which is there. There is one more company, Messrs. B and Company, which is a partner of A and Company. And therefore, a and company is a partnership firm in which there is another partner B and company. So the question over here is the AO said that the partnership firm cannot become a partner in another partnership firm. And therefore, I am treating this partnership firm as an AOP and not as a partnership firm. Because in this partnership firm, 
there is another partner therefore the joint venture of both of them cannot be called as a partnership firm the joint venture of both of them should be called as what as an eop and the answer is correct partnership firm is not a legal person in india it is does not have a legal identity therefore a partnership firm having a partnership in another partnership firm cannot be called joint venture cannot be called as a partnership firm it will be called as an aop and therefore the ao is correct in justifying that 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 the assessee is not an, a partnership firm but an association of person now the next question is one of the most beautiful questions of this entire booklet a beautiful question there are so many provisions which are asked in this particular question which i will try to address you all one by one year now so pay attention please the very first thing is mr ram is a citizen of usa and he resides in some san josa etc 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 pay absolute attention please it's a beautiful question now he is a non resident since 2006 2007 now he works in a foreign company now in 2022 he came to india the very first thing which you are supposed to do is please change this days to 2022 and the last date to 2023 and year also you have to change this date to 2022 to 2023 okay this will become 22 this will become 23 in short model of the story change all the dates as per the current year okay now who is this assassin this assassin is a non resident until last year now in the current year that is in on jan 10 2022 he came to india and he was there in india till 31st of jan 2023 it means he is there in india for how many days if you count he is there in india for 306 days okay from 1st april till 31st jan if you count there are 306 days so is he resident the answer is yes the very first thing which we have got it he is a resident the second thing is he ordinary or not ordinary he is not ordinary because he was non resident till he was non resident since 2006 7 he has come to india after lot of time after lot of time in 2022 he came to india therefore the possibility of fulfilling the two additional condition is impossible that is 730 days in the last 7 years two two times resident in out of last 10 years that is impossible over here therefore i have got his residential status first thing he is a resident but a not ordinary resident now in case of resident and not ordinary resident when the income is taxable in india either the income has to be accrued in india or the income has to be received in india in case of pgbp even if it is accrued outside india but it is controlled from india then also it is taxable but in this question pgbp is not there in this question pgbp income is not there so talk about normal income normal income like salary interest etc it is taxable in india for nor only if it is accrued in india if it is received in india now he is in india from when from jan till next jan he is in india let's talk about the current year in the current year he is in india from april till what in from april till jan he is in india so they have given us the salary to us so is that salary taxable in india that sex salary is taxable in india because he has services he has rendered services in india check it please he has come to india for work from home in india so if an nor is coming to india is working from india so is rendering services in india so he will be liable to tax in india okay definitely he has to pay tax in india this is the first thing which you have to keep it in your mind now be very careful be very careful be very careful there are a lot of things in that sir will he not get exemption under section 61 sir we have learned uh, under section 106 under section 106 we have learned one exemption sir what exemption you have learned in section 106 that if a non resident who is a if, if a person who is not a citizen of india if a person who is not a citizen of india who is employed by a foreign enterprise and if he comes to india then his remuneration will be exempt will he not get this exemption no 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 big he will not get this exemption because there is one condition over there the condition is the stay in india should not exceed 90 days and he is staying in india for how many days he is staying in india india for more than 90 days he is staying in india for 306 days therefore he will not be eligible for that exemption forget about that exemption okay till be liable to tax now how to compute that you have to convert all the salary into what rupees now how to convert that to convert that you have to apply rule 115 as per rule 115 the rupees as per rule 115 the current the salary income is converted as per the ttbr of the preceding month what is the ttbr of the preceding month so for april you have to take the ttbr of the preceding month now luckily the ttbr of the preceding month is given over here and it is same for every month so luckily it is very simple for us 6250 into how many months from april to jan 10 months into 72 will get the salary okay so once we get the salary we'll take what we will not take the standard deduction because the assessee is opting for what 115 bsc so 10 months into 6250 into ttbr which is given in the last column so once we'll get this we'll get the salary okay will not get the standard deduction because he is opting for 115 bsc now he is earning one more income one more income which he is earning over here is fixed deposit in us now because this fixed deposit is in us it is accrued outside india it is received also outside india therefore that will not be taxable in india for nor for nor only income which is accrued in india or which is received in india are taxable therefore this income will not be taxable for him then you compute the tax as per 115 bsc and then you will get the taxes 11 lakh 31000 now 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 we have to give him what ftc ftc is how much of ftc is available in india in india ftc available is very simple you get the ftc as tax paid in india or tax paid in foreign country whichever is lower whatever is lower that will be allowed as ftc for ftc we have to read article 2 of dt double a the taxes covered for the federal taxes in imposed by the internal revenue code internal revenue code is the law of us but excluding social security tax you are not 
supposed to take the social security tax in that. Now, here also we have to make two assumptions that these taxes which are there, it is excluding social security tax. One assumption is this. Second assumption is this. These taxes are including social security tax. If it is including social security tax now, then out of this 1600, you have to remove this 420. 420 you have to remove. So that is what you are supposed to do over here. So there are two assumptions which we are making over here. First assumption we are making over here is that this 1600 is what? This 1600 is excluding, is excluding what? Is excluding the social security tax. Therefore, 1600 into 10 into 72, this will come to 1131. And if this is 1131, uh, this will not come to, uh, just wait. This will come to, uh, this will come to 1152. And if this comes to 1152, the tax payable in foreign country is 1152. The tax payable in India is 1131. Therefore, whichever is lower is 1131. Therefore, entire tax will be exempt in India. You are not supposed to pay any tax. But there is one more assumption which is made by ICI. The another assumption which is made by ICI is that, that 1600 federal tax is including the social security tax and on social security tax you do not get what credit credit is not available on social security tax now if credit is not available on social security tax you have to remove that much from 1600 remove 420 then multiply by 10 and into 72 that will come to 849 therefore you will get a credit of how much 1131 or 849 whichever is lower and therefore you will get a credit of 849 and therefore you have to pay tax of 281 400 but here one more mistake you are doing you are filing the return on 25th of august it means you should have filed the return on 31st of july 31st of july you should have filed the return but you are filing on 25th of August, therefore, you have to pay interest at the rate of 1% if you follow second assumption. In case of first assumption, you don't have to follow any interest, but in case of second assumption, you have to follow you have to pay interest at the rate of 1% under section 234A because you are delaying to file the return by one month. So, this is what this great question is all about. If it comes, it will come in the same form in the uh, next attempt. So, be very careful you do this question properly before the exam. In fact, I have said every aspect of this question beautifully to you all so that you understand each and everything properly. Okay, now the next question, question number 3A there is an investment fund and this investment fund has 20 resident unit holders and five uh, each each unit holders holdings five units now out of that 16 unit holders are holding units for more than 12 months and four unit holders are holding units for less than 12 months so 16 is to 4 ratio is how much 80 is to 20 it means i can say 80 percent of the unit holders are holding units for more than 12 months and i can say 20 percent of the unit holders are holding units for less than 12 months you should understand the importance of more than eight more than 12 months and less than 12 months okay there is some provision which are linked to this particular aspect now the first income which is earned by business trust uh, sorry investment fund is business income always remember business income tax will be payable by fund only in the hands of investor it is exempt 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 okay second long term capital loss long term capital loss tax is payable by the investor but if what if uh, long term capital gains tax is payable by the investor it is exempt in the hands of the fund what about long term capital loss long term capital loss you can attribute to the investor to the extent if the investors are holding units for more than 12 months now how many investors are holding units for more than 12 months only 80 percent therefore out of this 30 lakhs you can attribute 80 percent to the investors which investors will carry forward and set off in subsequent years for eight years because in the current year anyways there is no loss there is no gain against that the investors cannot set off because in the current year there is no long term capital gains there has to be a long term capital gains to set of a long term capital loss. So, out of 30 lakh loss, you can attribute 80 percent to the investor. Why? Because the units are held by more than 12 months, you can attribute. Third one, income from other source. In it is exempt in the hands of the fund. Fund will not pay tax on other source, investor will pay tax on other source. Okay. Last line, they are asking one question Will your answer change if the investment fund distributes only 80 percent? The answer will remain same. Why? Because in case of investment fund and in case of securitization trust, whether you distribute or whether you do not distribute, entire amount will be taxable in the hands of the investor out of the 40 lakh rupees income from other source if i distribute only 80 percent still i have to deduct areas on entire 40 lakhs still entire 40 lakhs is taxable in the hands of the investors in the by logic of what deemed accrual this logic is applicable for investment fund and for what for securitization trust but this logic is not applicable for business trust for business trust the amount is taxable in the hands of the recipient on receipt basis not on accrual basis so in case of business trust if i distribute only 80 percent only 80 percent will be taxable in the hands of the other person but not here okay the next question is a very simple question now it has become simple by default it is not simple but now it has become simple because we have done this question a lot of time there is a non-resident foreign company it is earning some dividend of 20 percent a dividend of 12 lakh 50 thousand this will be taxable at 20 percent under 115a now it is also receiving some it is that non-resident foreign company is giving some technical services to us and we are and we are paying them 20 lakh rupees by what by giving them what a debenture we are not giving them money but we are giving them deb debenture now this will be subject to what this will be subject to 40 percent tax why sir will it not be covered in 115a it will not be covered in 115a because this is not there is no agreement between the two and the agreement is also not approved by central government therefore this will be covered in normal provision apart from that the non-resident is also earning now 8 percent interest on what to, to 20 lakh rupees so that interest will also be subject to 40 percent tax that interest will also cannot come under 115a because it is earned in foreign 
Indian currency, not in foreign currency. So therefore, there are two treatments over here. 20 lakh rupees is the consideration for FDS, which will be taxable at 40%. And the interest is the consideration for what? Debentures, which will also be taxable at 40%. Now, they are also earning some dividend on global deposit receipts. These global deposit receipts were purchased in foreign currency. Therefore, it will be subject to tax at the rate of 10% under 115AC. Business income will be taxed at 40%. Now, the last one is, they are also earning some royalty. Now, this royalty, there is an agreement and it is approved by central government. And the DT double is 10 for 12%. But the income tax rate says 10 percent, therefore, now this will be taxable at what 10 percent. Now, there are two important things to be kept in mind here it will be taxable at 10 percent. Second thing, here it uh, there are two things which we need to keep in mind this amount is received by the SSE, and if this amount is received by the SSE, you have to gross up this because the amount received in your bank account is after TDS. This amount is also received by the SSE, and if it is received by the SSE, you have to gross up because the amount received in the bank account is after TDS. So here the TDS rate is how much? 10.4%. Here the tax rate is how much? It is again 10.4%. So at both the places, you have to divide by 89.6%. Check it, please. So let's go on to question number four, which is based on tax deduction at source. Now, in the first part, there are two parts. Uh, there is there is an infrastructure debt fund in India, which is making payment to a non-resident. So how much TDS it will deduct? Under 194 LB, it will deduct TDS at the rate of 5% plus 4% says that is 2.5%. Okay. Now, this same infrastructure debt fund is making payment to a person located in NJ. So, if you make a payment to a person located in NJ, then the 194 LB 5% will not be applicable. Then you are supposed to deduct TDS at the rate of 30% plus 4% says that will come to 31.2%. Okay. Now, the next point is very, very simple. We have done two, three times earlier. Is TDS deductible on commission which is retained by the consignee, etc.? Yes, TDS is deductible on commission retained by the consignee. We have done that in the earlier uh, mock test paper or RTP paper, lot of time. Okay. Now, next one is Mr. Harsh, an employee. Uh, this is a new question. This has not come earlier. This is an employee who joined the company in 2019 and resigned in 2023. Now, because he has resigned before five years, he has left the company before five years. Uh, whatever PF which he will withdraw will be subject to tax. Now, if the amount of that PF paid by the company to the employee is 50,000 or more, then the company will deduct TDS at the rate of 10% under section 192A because the amount withdrawn by the employee is 80,000 rupees, which is more than 50,000. Secondly, the employee is also leaving company within five years. Therefore, it is taxable and therefore you are supposed to deduct TDS at the rate of 10% under 192A. Next one, Mr. Money has sold his flat and the other person is what? Purchasing, uh, Mr. Money is purchasing some flat. The value of the flat is 48 lakhs. Okay. But does the consideration for TDS purpose, again, it is asking about TDS. So does the consideration for TDS purpose only include the basic consideration? No. The money, Master Money has also paid some maintenance charges. That should also be included 1,20,000, 24 months into 5,000 per month. So that will come to 1,20,000. He has also paid 2 lakh for car parking. That should also be included. He has also paid 1 lakh for club membership. That should also be included. So if I take the total, all these things are part of consideration because consideration is defined under section 194 IA. You can go and check. All these things are included in that. Now, if I include all these things, all of them are totaling more than 50 lakh rupees. And because it is more than 50 lakh rupees, I have to deduct. That is, the money has to deduct while purchasing the flat 1% TDS. If the stamp duty would, ha would have been higher, suppose if the stamp duty would have been 60 lakhs, then you would have deducted TDS also on 60 lakh rupees. Okay. Now, the next question is a very important question. I am myself saying it's a very important question, but it's a repetitive question. We have done this entire question, uh, same to same question a lot of times, and therefore I'm not repeating. It's a very important question. So you have to go through this question at your end if you have time, but I'm not going through because I'm, I'm explaining everything from the perspective of what? Exam. Therefore, I'm not going through this question. Your, your paper is completed. This paper is completed. Then we'll move ahead with the next paper. Okay. So let's move on to the next paper that is December 2021 attempt. Okay, that is uh, the first question which is based on 115 BAB now. So accordingly, you have to think from the perspective of 115 BAB over here. Okay, and one important thing over here, the SSC is a manufacturer. He will not get additional depreciation. 115 BAB SSC does not get additional depreciation. Second important thing, the SSC is engaged in leather product. And if an SSC is engaged in leather, uh, apparel or footwear, then the number of days of employment under 80 JJAA is only 150 days. It is not 240 days. So these are some of the important points which should click to your mind immediately you, you see such words in the, your exams okay now the SSE is in, is in your state that is in the state of Tamil Nadu okay uh, the profit of the company is 1 crore 20 lakh rupees let's start with the first adjustment the opening stock and closing stocks are overvalued and undervalued by 10% now first of all let's talk about opening stock the opening stock is overvalued it means it is 110% so if the opening stock is overvalued add back okay and if the closing stock is undervalued it means it is 90% so you have to what add back that also the, because closing stock is undervalued so, so you have to add increase that much closing stock it means you have to increase that much credit side it means you have to increase that much profit in your books of accounts okay next one you are making some payment of 10 lakh rupees as commission to mr john who is a non-resident now mr john has not given any services to you in india he has done some services outside india he has procured some order outside india and you are making payment of commission to him so in that case mr john's income is not accrued in india if his income is not accrued in india you are not liable to deduct tds and in that case if you have not deducted the tds the expenditure will be fully allowed because the other person's income in section 195 when you deduct tds if the income of the other person 
is chargeable to tax in India. Now the income of Mr. John is not chargeable to tax in India because he is not procuring orders in India. He is procuring orders outside India. Therefore, do not make any disallowance. Okay. Next one, you are making 45,000 payment in cash to Mr. Raj an employee. You will say it is disallowed but not disallowed. Why? Because this payment is in respect of retirement benefits. Whenever you make any payment of retirement benefits to your employees, you can make the payment in cash up to 50,000 rupees. That is given in Rule 6DD. In Rule 6DD, that is given. So, be very careful with that. Okay. The next one is a very simple one. I am not much interested in that. That is based on what grandfathering you can go through it once okay the next one is point number five because this grandfathering 112a 55 section 55 it has come a lot of time that how to derive cost of acquisition in case of grandfathering the next one is an important one you are transferring some capital asset on which no depreciation is allowable it means it is not a part of block of asset it is a normal asset so in case of normal asset which is not part of block of asset the stcg will be chargeable under 115 bab at 22 percent be very careful this will be chargeable at 22 percent so reduce from pgbb and show under what show under capital gains charge at 22 percent because it is covered under 115 bab next one is also very simple you are selling some plot of land to your so to your subsidiary etc then that is subject to what a hundred percent subsidiary that is subject to exemption under section 47 so reduce from pgbb show under what show under capital gains as exempt income next one is an important one because you are receiving some dividends you are receiving some dividend if you are receiving some dividend first of all you have to remove from pgbp okay secondly when you go to ifos and show under ifos you have to gross up that dividend because this is a received amount this is not earned amount so you will gross up that dividend and you will show that dividend as 50000 divided by 90% that will come to 55555 next you are making some payment for inauguration of a new branch for expanding the business yes that is allowed as a revenue expenditure there is nothing wrong in that next you are making some penalty to the government for failure to perform the contract on time, etc. So, you are making the compensation for that. So, this is allowed because this is not a penal penalty. This is a compensatory penalty and compensatory penalty is allowed as a deduction. Next, you are incurring some VRS expenditure of 5 lakhs. It will not be allowed in one shot. It will be allowed in 5 installment. So, 1 fifth will be allowed and 4 fifth will be disallowed. It will be allowed in the subsequent years. Next, you are making some payment of 75,000 to bank. <coughs> uh, sorry, the person, there is one person, who there is one non-resident buyer who is outside India who has given you, this is a very intelligent point, huh? there is a non-resident buyer who is outside India, who is giving you some deposit. You are using that deposit in India for manufacturing purpose and you are paying that interest to the non-resident. This interest will be accrued in section 915. Therefore, you are liable to deduct TDS. Now, you have not deducted the TDS. Therefore, this 75,000 will be disallowed. Very, very important point. If a non-resident gives you money and you use that money in India for the purpose of business, you are using that for the purpose of manufacturing, then the interest paid to the non-resident is accrued in India, you are supposed to deduct TDS. You have not deducted the TDS. That is your mistake. Therefore, this amount will be disallowed under the income tax law. Next one, very important point. Uh, a very, very uh, debatable point, a question which has been asked by many students across the country to me. Now, finally, I am resolving that question. Now, this company has employed 60, 56 additional employees. Out of this, uh, out of, uh, now we have a breakup of that. Out of that, 39 employees were employed on 1st June at a salary of 15,000 rupees. So, but out of this 39 also, 9 employees were paid by what? Were paid by bearer checks. So, first of all, out of this 39, you have to remove this 9 employees. These 9 employees will not be subject to what? Deduction under 80 JJAA. So, whatever is the salary of these 9 employees, that will not be allowed as deduction to you but at the same time because you are paying the salary of these nine employees by better check you should also disallow that particular expenditure under pgbp why you have not been doing that since so many papers in so many mock tests and so many rtps they are not doing that so far so now finally they they, they are awake in december 2021 suggested answer now what are they doing they are disallowing this nine employees amount by better check okay so whatever is the salary of the nine employees they are disallowing in what pgbp but they are also giving an alternate answer that this information is given only for ATJJAA and everything in the PGBP is done correctly. So, if you take that assumption, then in that case, you don't have to disallow this nine employee salary in PGBP. It means in that case, you have to do whatever you have been doing so far. But according to me, the second one, first one is better. You disallow this nine employee salary also in PGBP. That is more correct and for more correct treatment as compared to what? Ignoring that particular adjustment by saying that this is only given for the purpose of ATJJAA. That is wrong. Now, what about other employees? These three employees, uh, these 14 employees were joined at an emolument of 45,700, they will not be eligible for the benefit. Why? Because the emolument is more than 25,000. These three employees will be eligible because these three employees are employed on 1st of November. So, if you count from 1st of November till 31st of March, it is more than 150 days. To be precise, it is 151 days and the SSC is engaged in which business? Leather business. So, 150 days is sufficient and therefore, for three employees, five months, 22,000 will be the salary. So, take the total of two and then take 30%, you will get the deduction. Last but not least, the SSC has paid 1,20,000 to National Fund for Rural Development. Now, this is available under 35 CCA. Now, in our normal provision, it is available under 35 CCA. But is it available under the provisions of 115 BAB also and BAA also? Yes, it is available under the provisions of 115 BAB also. 115 BAB does not allow 35 CCA, does not disallow 35 CCA. 115 BAB disallow what? It disallow 3511, 3514, it disallows what? 35 AD, but it does not 
not disallow what? It does not disallow this particular item. So it is a very important point that this 1,20,000 allowed under 35 CCA will be allowed as deduction. Last but not least, you have to compute tax. The manufacturing income will be subject to tax at 15%. This dividend income will be subject which you, which you have to gross up first. This will be subject to 22% tax and this short-term capital gains will also be subject to 22% tax. After that, you have to apply 10% surcharge and you will get your income tax. You can check it over here once if you want. So now let's move on to the next question, question number two, which is based on amalgamation of companies. There is one company, uh, Samay Impex Limited, which is an amalgamating company. Now this company is getting amalgamated with another company, Delhi Impex Limited. Now in case of amalgamation, what happens? Whatever the losses and whatever the UADs and capital expenditure of family planning, capital expenditure of scientific research, all these things can be carried forward by what? By the amalgamated company. But few losses are not allowed. Now the, we need to compute the total income of what? Delhi Impex Limited. Okay. So the to profit of Delhi Impex Limited is 175. Okay. That I'm writing over here. Now the first thing. Can I carry forward speculative loss? No, no, no. As per section 72A, it is very clearly written. You can carry forward non-speculative speculative loss given under section one, uh, given under section 72 and unabsorbed depreciation. You cannot carry forward what? You cannot carry forward speculative loss. This will not be allowed. Unabsorbed depreciation is allowed to carry forward by the amalgamated company? Yes. Whether the ex unabsorbed expenditure of capital expenditure is allowed? Yes, that is also allowed. Whether business loss is allowed? Yes, that business loss is allowed for another eight years, in fact. That is a greater benefit over here. So you can take this benefit also. Okay. Now, there is one mistake done by the company. What is the mistake? The company has transferred the asset at 160 lakh rupees to the amalgamated company. Now, they have taken depreciation at 160 lakhs only. No, no, no. You are not supposed to take depreciation at 160 lakhs. Suppose in amalgamation, if I am amalgamated company, you are amalgamating company and you are selling me assets for 160 lakhs. I am not supposed to claim depreciation at 160. I am supposed to claim depreciation at WDV. So, whatever depreciation comes on 160 lakhs, that is the consideration, purchase consideration. That is 160 lakhs into 15 percent that I will add back. Okay. And what is the WDV? WDV is 100 lakhs and therefore on 100 lakhs, I will take 15 percent reduction. After doing all these things, I'll get my gain as what? Uh, sorry, I'll get my profit as what? 39 lakhs, which is subject to tax. That will be chargeable to tax. Okay. Now, the next question is a very simple question on section 45, subsection 5, which is on compulsory acquisition. There is an associate who has purchased some land in 2003. In 2003, he has purchased the land. And in 2019, the land was compulsorily acquired, but he got the compensation from the government in 2000. 20. So, when the capital gains will be chargeable? Capital gains will be chargeable in 2020. That is the year in which the original compensation or the part of the compensation is received. But how will you compute the cost of acquisition? The cost of acquisition will be computed as 12 lakh rupees will be the cost multiplied by which year's indexation you will take? You will take indexation of 2019. Be very careful. 2019 indexation was what? 289 and divide by indexation of 209. And there is also 30,000 rupees transfer expenses. Why you will take indexation of 2019? Because you have to take indexation of the year in which the asset was transferred. So, indexation of 2019 divided by indexation of 2003 that will come to plus 30,000 rupees you have to also take expenses of transfer you come with a loss of 12 lakh 11,000 then in the next year you also get 18 lakh rupees enhanced compensation so that I'm writing over here to earn that enhanced compensation you have uh, incurred an expense of what 1 lakh rupees so that you can take as a deduction legal expenses incurred to earn the enhanced compensation that is allowed as an expenditure plus whatever loss is over here you can claim that loss as a set off against your enhanced compensation capital gains okay the next one next one next one is a very very good question over here very beautiful question that this question is on transactional net margin method you have to do this question before exam it's a very very good question and this question has not come earlier now there are two companies over here one is alpha limited which is in india and alpha nc which is outside india okay and if i compare both of them the assets of alpha limited is 120 lakhs and out of that how much is given as a finance by alpha nc 82.5 lakhs how i got 82.5 lakhs 1 lakh 50 thousand dollar into what is the rate of the dollar into 55 i will get what 82.5 lakhs now if i take that this comes to 68.75 percent it means my book value of assets 68.75 percent is financed by alpha nc therefore both of them are deemed to be associated now we are supposed to find out the arm's length price as per the transactional net margin method now what happens in transactional net margin method first of all step one we are supposed to find out the net margin with the associate enterprise. While taking the net margin, numerator will be net profit, but the denominator will be either sales or cost. Now, what to take? What to take as a denominator? That I have told you. If you are doing export, it means if you are selling to someone, then take the denominator as cost. Or if you are purchasing from someone, then you take the denominator as sale. Now, in this question, what are we doing? We are selling. We are giving services. Therefore, I am taking the denominator as cost. Okay. So, first of all, you are supposed to find out the arm's length margin, that is net profit margin with associate entity. Now, with associate entity, what is my cost? The cost is 80 rupees over here. What is my profit margin? 
85 is my billing co billing and 80 rupees is the cost. The profit margin is 5 rupees. Therefore, with associate entity, my profit margin is 6.25%. Now, what is my profit margin with my uncontrolled transaction? With my con controlled transaction, the profit is 100 rupees. So, I'm taking 100 rupees in the numerator. And what is my cost in case of uncontrolled? Why I'm taking cost in the denominator? Because denominator has to be untainted. And in case of sale, the cost will be untainted. And in case of purchase, the sale will be untainted. And in this question, what are we doing? We are selling. Therefore, the sale price will be tainted. Therefore, take in the denominator untainted item that is cost. And in case of undelated party, the cost is 500 plus 100, that is 600. You get the arm's length margin as 16.67%. Once you get that, that margin you will apply on what? On your on your cost. And therefore that, you will get what? Your arm's length price. Okay, there is nothing great after that. You can do the question at your end after that. Okay, you, most important thing over here was to compute the margin. That's it. Once you get that margin, then you will apply that margin on what? On your cost. So your cost is what? 80 into what 30,000 hours into what into 55 rupees per and then on that you will apply what 16.67 margin you will get your arm's length price okay now coming to the next question next question next question <coughs> the next question is on what <coughs> so this is on exit tax exit tax means accredited income now let's see there are some important points over here the very first thing is the trust was formed in 2006 and the trust got registered in 2010 Therefore, whatever activity trust would have done from 2006 to 2010 would be taxable and on that activity accredited income cannot be charged. Be very careful. Accredited income cannot be charged on activity which is done before the trust was registered. Okay. Now, we need to compute what for accredited income? We need to compute the uh, all the assets and all the liabilities as per rule 17 CB. Now, for land what are we going to take? The total value, book value of the land is 12 lakhs and the market value of the land is what? Is 50 lakhs. So, whichever is higher we are supposed to take. Generally, we are supposed to take the stamp duty value or market value whichever is higher your stamp duty value is not the given so take the market value only so market value how much should i take i will take only three fourth of the market value why because there is some very important adjustment now a lot of students have asked this doubt to me i'm clearing this doubt here itself this doubt should not come to you henceforth okay now be very careful there is one adjustment adjustment number four which says that land and building is acquired out of agriculture income now your land and building is costing 12 lakhs now you have taken a loan of 9 lakhs, obviously for to buy an asset of 12 lakhs, if you have taken a loan of 9 lakhs, it means the agriculture income is used only to the extent of 3 lakh rupees, na? because out of 12 lakh asset, 9 lakh is loan only, loan is not from agriculture income, that is from bank, na? so out of the total asset of 12 lakh, only 3 lakh is bought from agriculture income, therefore only one fourth of the land is bought from agriculture income, so if any asset is bought from agriculture income, that should not form part of a credit income, it is very clearly written in the law in 115TD, therefore one fourth of the asset is bought from agriculture income, Therefore, out of 50 lakhs, I am not taking one fourth of the asset. I am only taking three fourth of the asset. I am taking 37.5. Please check it over there. Okay. Next, for equity shares, I am going to take the market value, and the market value is given is 18 lakh rupees. You can check it over here. For what? For land, I am taking 37.50. For equity shares, I am taking market value that is 18 lakh rupees. Now, for unquoted shares, you have to make some calculations. You have some e equity investments in unquoted shares of Z Limited. Now, you have to compute the unquoted, you have to compute the value of the Z Limited, and then you have to find out how much stake you have in that particular company. Be very careful. Now, for that, you have to take the total book value of what? Z Limited. Total, uh, total book value of the Z Limited is 60 lakh rupees. Then the market value of jewelry is 30 lakh rupees. And the liabilities, now you are computing the value of the shares of Z Limited first. Okay, because we need to find out how much value we have in that particular company. So 60 plus 30, 90. 90 minus 30 is how much? 35 lakh. Minus 35, how much? It comes to 55 lakhs. Now out of 55 lakhs, that is the total worth of Z Limited. How much we have in that company? See, we have investment of 1 lakh 50 and the total value of Z Limited is 10 lakh. Therefore, if the total value of the total equity capital of Z Limited is 10 lakh and we have 1 lakh 50 investment, it means we have 15% investment in that. And therefore, what is the total net worth of Z Limited? It is 55 lakhs. Out of which, how much we have? We have 15% of that. But out of that also, 50% of the unquoted shares were acquired before the confirm was registered, before the trust was registered. Therefore, while computing the accredited income, you will only take the 50% of the value of your investment. Therefore, total value of Z Limited is 55 lakhs, out of which 15% we own. Out of that also, 50% was purchased before the trust was registered. So, during that period, if whatever is purchased, that is not subject to what? That is not subject to what? Accredited income. Therefore, only that much will come and therefore the answer will come to 4,12,500. Be very careful. Very, very good question. Cash, you will take directly. Bank, you will take directly. And this 9 lakh rupees loan, you will take what? <coughs> This 9 lakh rupees loan which you have taken for the purpose of building, that also you will take directly. Okay, you will take directly. What about this unquoted shares? Unquoted shares you will not take because this loan was also taken in 2007 8. If this loan would have taken in 2010 11, 12 13, then I would have taken this loan also because 2007 8 uh, the, the trust was not registered. You are not supposed to take the assets also of that particular period and not the liability of that particular period. Once you do all these things, you will get your accredited income. No, no, no. One more thing you are supposed to do. When is the trust getting dissolved? The trust is getting dissolved on 29th of December 2021. Do 
you remember there is one provision if the trust is dissolved and within 12 months if you transfer the assets to another trust registered under the income tax law then that much can be reduced so you are transferring within 12 months c to another trust and therefore if you are transferring within 12 months to another trust if you are transferring within 12 months to another trust and therefore you can reduce that much 8 lakh rupees also from what from your accredited income so i am reducing this 8 lakh rupees also from my accredited income and on the balance income i am paying 40 whatever is the tax rate 34 point 944%. I hope it is clear to all of you. The next question is a very simple DTAA question. There is a resident assessee whose age is 62 years. He is following what? He is opting for 115 BSC. Be very careful. If he is opting for 115 BSC, you need to be careful with few things. First of all, you are not going to get the deduction of standard deduction. Okay. Now, the second thing, you are also not going to get the deduction of what? Uh, house property SOP interest. House property SOP interest is not allowed for 115 BSC assessee. Thirdly, you are not going to get the deduction of ATC and ATD also. So, these are the few things which they will test as far as 115 BSC is considered. I don't think so. Anything apart from that can be tested by ICI. Next question. Question number 4 is a very good question. There are a lot of small small points over here. The first question in question number 4A sub part 1 they are asking on 194O. There is one website by the name called as abc.com which is an e-commerce operator and there is one seller Mr. Z who is a resident seller. Now he gives a valid pan to the e-commerce operator. So e-commerce operator is nothing but Amazon and Mr. Z is nothing but a seller on the Amazon who is a listed seller on Amazon and he is a resident. Now he is selling goods worth rupees 60 lakhs. Now is the Amazon liable to deduct TDS? Yes. At the time of payment or at the time of credit whichever is earlier. Now how much TDS he will deduct? He will deduct 1% because the seller is giving PAN. If the seller would have not given the PAN then I would have deducted 5%. That I have told you earlier also. Now so for the very first time they have credited in the books of accounts on 31st December. So Amazon will deduct TDS at the rate of 1% or 20 lakhs. Then he will deduct 1% at the rate of 1% uh, on 15 lakhs on 28th of Feb. Okay. Now, there is one more thing. The total sale is 60 lakhs. Now, how much is completed till year? Till year 35 lakhs is completed. The TDS on 35 lakhs is completed. Now, 10 lakhs goods are directly sold, directly paid by the customer to Amazon. So, if customer directly paid to the seller, sorry, if the customer directly paid to the seller, then is that also subject to TDS? Yes, this 10 lakh is also subject to TDS and this 10 lakh is also covered in what? 60 lakhs. Therefore, how much is over now? 30 plus 10, 45 is over. Now, the balance money is received on 31st of March. So, what is the balance left now? The balance left is 15 plus lakhs and on that 15 lakhs, also Amazon is liable to deduct TDS. So, there are four steps in which Amazon will deduct TDS. First on 20 lakhs because Amazon is crediting, then again 15 lakhs, then again Amazon is crediting. This, this is directly credited by customer to what? To the seller. This will also be subject to TDS and it is included in 60 lakhs. Okay. So, it is not over and above 60 lakhs and the balancing figure over here will come to how much? It will come to 15 lakhs. Next one is a very, very, very good question over here. Mr. Raghav is a dealer in car. Okay. And Mr. Raghav's last year's turnover is 9.8 crore from sale of car and from sale of spare parts and service station it is 60 lakhs. In short, Mr. Raghav's last year turnover is more than 10 crore rupees. That is sufficient for us to understand that there are some implications of certain important provisions over here. Now, Mr. Raghav is manufacturing car and selling cars. Okay. Now, Mr. Raghav is selling cars. So, if Mr. Raghav is selling cars to customers, then and if the value of the car is more than 10 lakh rupees, then it is liable to deduct TDS under 206C1F. Okay. And if it is less than 10 lakhs, then 206C1H might be applicable. So, first of all, we need to give priority to 1F first because Mr. Karaga is a dealer of car, manufacturer of car. His first duty is to sell the car. 2061F will be at priority. Therefore, if the sale consideration is more than 10 lakhs, he has to collect TCS under 2061F. So, for the first car, for the second car, and for the fourth car, he will collect TCS under 2061F because the consideration is more than 10 lakhs. But what about the third car? For third car, Institute has given two views. First view is he will not collect TCS under 2061H. He will not collect TCS under it is wrong, it is 1H. Here it is 1F. For the third car, he will not collect TCS under 2061H. Why, why, why? Because the threshold of 2061H is 50 lakhs. He is not selling cars of more than 50 lakhs. He is only selling cars of what? 8 lakhs. Therefore, he will not collect TCS. This is one of the view. You can write this. It is correct. The second view which is taken by Institute is because all the cars including 1F and 1H is excluding 50 lakhs. Is it excluding or not? If I take the total of all the cars, is it exceeding 50 lakhs? It is exceeding 50 lakhs definitely. So, because the aggregate of all the cars is exceeding 50 lakhs and the last year turnover is also greater than 10 crore of the SSE. Therefore, on this 8 lakh rupees, you can collect TCS at the rate of 0.01%. This is the, the, this is the provision which the SSE has applied over here. Okay. Uh, which institute has applied over here. The next question is also a beautiful question and a very, 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 very important question. Be very careful with this question. There are a lot of small, small things in this question. I am trying to address you all of them one by one. The first thing is the assessee is an individual. He is a non-resident and he is a person of Indian origin. Therefore, he is an NRI. 
and if he is an nri he has an option to opt for chapter 6 chapter 12a he has an option but the question is saying that forget about option he has to opt compute the question as per compute tax payable tax refund as per what the special provisions only it means you have to follow chapter 12a only now what happens in chapter 12a in chapter 12a it's very simple the long term capital gains from specified assets and interest and dividend income will be subject to concessional tax rate now what is specified asset long term capital gains from transfer of specified foreign exchange assets will be subject to what tax at 10% only. So, this 8,50,000 will be subject to 10% tax plus you have also incurred the expenses. You can reduce that expenses on transfer also 8,20,000. Now, now, now. There is one section under chapter 12 which says that after transferring the specified foreign exchange asset, if you purchase another specified asset within 6 months, then you will get the exemption under 115F. But there the problem is you are transferring the asset on 31st of May 2022 and you are purchasing another fix, another specified asset. Public limited shares are specified assets as per 115C. It is specified asset. But the problem is not this. The problem, the asset is correct. But the problem is you are buying late. Therefore, you are not going to get the deduction of, you are not going to get what? The exemption over here of what? 1,80,000. 1,80,000 exemption you cannot ask for. Therefore, the the ultimate conclusion will be what this long term capital gains will be subject to this 30,000 deduction of expenses and this 8,20,000 will be subject to 10% tax and this 1,80,000 is not allowed if the asset would have been purchased within 6 months we would have allowed okay next is interest on deposits with private limited company private limited companies are deposits are not covered only public limited companies are deposits are covered in 115 c2i in chapter 12 private limited deposits are not covered therefore this will be taxed at slab rate okay interest on government securities interest on government securities is covered provided we have to assume that it is purchased in foreign currency so we have to make two assumptions therefore ICI has given two answers first assumption they are making that this will be subject to what this will be sub this is assumed to be a forex it is purchased in foreign currency therefore chapter 12 is applicable therefore this interest will be subject to 20% tax but if we assume that this is not in forex then this will be taxed at what this 1 lakh is also taxed at slab rates along with this 2 lakh 93,000 both the answers are given by ICI you can check then this this short term capital gains will be charged at what triple 1a and last but not least whichever assumption you take whether you assume this in forex or you do not assume this in forex you will get a deduction of chapter 6a of 1 lakh 50,000 rupees over here and therefore there are two solutions over here in first solution they are assuming that this interest on security is purchased in foreign currency and second assumptions they are assuming that this interest on security is not purchased in foreign currency accordingly the answers will change to some extent okay now coming to question number five which are based on some important case laws the first question is can CIT revise an intimation under 143.1 under 264? See, by default, it is very clearly written in the law in section 264 that CIT can revise any order other than the order mentioned in 263. He can revise any order other than the order mentioned in 263. But he cannot revise intimation. It is very clear. He cannot revise intimation. That is not written. But what is written in the law, he can revise any order. Now, is an intimation an order? Practically speaking, intimation is not an order. Practically speaking, it should not be revised. But this case law has said that, yes, CIT can revise the intimation also as per section 264. So, there is a case law. There is one of the case law which is giving this benefit to the SSE. So, forget about it. If it is giving, we are no one to stop that. We are not beyond the judiciary system. Okay. Now, there is one SSE. There is an SSE firm and there is a transporter over here. This SSE firm has given some contract to the transporter for transporting certain things. Now, this transporter has done what? They have taken service of some other person. They are not owning the vehicle. They are taking services of some other person. Now, if you are making the payment to such transporter, who is not owning the vehicle. He is giving outsourcing the service to somebody else. Are you supposed to deduct TDS under 194C? Yes, yes, yes. You are supposed to deduct TDS under 194C. If you do not deduct TDS, then it will be subject to 30% disallowance because in 194C, it is not necessary that the other person should own a vehicle. It is not necessary. It is not necessary that the other person should have their, his own vehicle. He can outsource that particular thing to some other person and you can take the services in that manner also. In that case also, it will be subject to what? TDS under 194C. Okay. <coughs> The next one is very simple. Uh, there is an SSE who has bought box, bo who has bought back some shares from the shareholder. Now we all know that when you back, when you buy back the shares from the shareholders, you are liable to pay tax under Section 115QA. Now the SSE paid the tax, and then the assessing officer passed some order. Now the SSE is aggrieved with that order. SSE did not like that order. So the question is, the AO has passed an order, and the SSE do not like the order. Can SSE directly go to High Court and file a writ petition? The question is that. Can SSE escape the route given under the income tax law and can file a writ petition under the income tax law? And the answer is no, no, and no. 
Why? Because writ petition is available if there is no remedy in the law. Now, if there is a remedy in the law to file an appeal to CIT appeal, why the hell you are going for writ petition? It is not allowed to go. Therefore, the contention of the assessee is wrong. Next one is a very simple question. There is a company which is there outside India. It's an e-commerce operator. They do not have any permanent establishment in India and they do not bill more than 1 lakh also to the customer. They are providing some online advertisement services and if they do not bill more than 1 lakh, then 2020 equalization levy will be applicable and if they bill more than 1 lakh, then 2016 equalization levy will be applicable. So now, it's a very, very simple question. You are providing services of 1.2 you are selling goods of 1.2 crore to indian residents and to other than indian residents to other indian residents you are selling goods of 70 lakhs and to uh, other customers to non-residents who target indian customers that is also covered in 2020 equalization level you are selling 20 lakhs so total you are selling almost 2.1 crore which is greater than 2 crore so you are satisfying all the conditions of 2020 equalization levy therefore the xyz.com is liable for what equalization levy at the rate of 2 percent or 2.1 crore okay now the next paper next question next question not next paper the next question is based on whether gar will be applicable in the following cases or not there is a company by the name called as highway drive limited which is a wholly owned subsidiary of mrs highway limited now its main business is what to develop infrastructure and take deduction under atia now what are they doing they are deriving some income which is other than infrastructure they are not doing infrastructure work they are doing some other work but they are showing that as an infrastructure and enjoying benefit under atia whether gar will be applicable gar will not be applicable because this is a clear case of tax evasion gar is applicable in case of tax avoidance okay it is not a tax avoidance it's a clear case of tax evasion therefore gar will not be applicable second case second case second case highway roads limited purchases the supply uh, from at a price lesser than fmb now this company and it's only in subsidiary one is there in what one is eligible for claim deduction under atia another is not eligible to claim deduction under ATIA. Now they are selling and buying something for what? Selling and buying something for la less than the fair market value. So in that case, so specified domestic transaction, transfer pricing is applicable, 92 BA is applicable. So again, there is a specific anti-avoidance rule. Therefore, the GAR cannot be made applicable in this case. Check it, please. Now the next question is a very important question. It's a theory question, but very important question. The first question in this is, does the assessing officer has the power to what? Revoke the provisional attachment as he has the power to revoke provisional attachment. That is the first question. If yes, from whom and to what extent? And the third question, does he have the power to invoke such bank guarantee? So on and so forth. Now, please pay attention. First of all, does he have the power to revoke the uh, provisional attachment? Once he has done the provisional attachment, can he revoke it? Yes. By an order in writing, he can revoke a provisional attachment. When he can revoke? If the SSE furnishes a guarantee. Guarantee from where? Guarantee from a scheduled bank of how much of an amount not less than the value fair market value of the property attached or that much amount which is necessary to protect the interest of the revenue. At, much, at, at least that much guarantee has to be given by the SSE which is necessary to protect the interest of the revenue. He will what? He will work, he will, in, he will in, uh, revoke the bank guarantee. Now, can he invoke the bank guarantee? Invoke means can he realize the bank guarantee? Yes. If there is a notice of demand on the SSE which is served on the SSE and SSE fails to pay the demand on time, he can invoke the bank guarantee, he can go, to, go and tell to the bank, please pay me the money. Or if the SSE fails to what? Renew the bank guarantee. Or if he fails to what? Furnish a new bank guarantee within 15 days from the expiry of the old bank guarantee. If he does not do these things, then he will be liable for what? The AO has the power to invoke bank guarantee. It invoke means he can go to the bank and tell that I want the money. Okay. The next are few theory questions which you can go through at your end. First is, uh, what is thin capitalization? You have to write the version of 94B, which we have done it in class. Is any threshold limited? Yes, one crore is applicable. Applicability of different entity to whom 94B is applicable? 94B is applicable to Indian companies or permanent establishment of foreign company. Is there any exclusion? Yes, banks and insurance companies are excluded. Next question is also a very theoretical question. What are the two types of DT? DTAA limited comprehensive limited DTAA means DTAA where we do not expose ourselves to all the types of incomes we only consider few incomes with the other country like India Pakistan DTAA or limited DTAA comprehensive DTAA means where we expose all the incomes we discuss we have articles of all the incomes in our DTAA that DTAA are called as comprehensive DTAA go through it once if you want so let's move on to the next paper that is May 2022 exam paper the first question over here is on manufacturing company this SSC is eligible for they are opting for 115 BAA now the very first adjustment is depreciation you have to add it back the next next one is employer contribution is paid till the due date of filing of return therefore allowed but employees contribution cannot be paid till the due date of filing of return that is not allowed it has to be paid by 15th of the following month and therefore that is disallowed okay next one is uh, penalty on GST is not allowed as because it is penal in nature but interest on GST is allowed because it is compensatory in nature Next one. When you are making payment for certain notified skill development project which are covered under 80 CCD, that is not allowed under 115 BAA, not allowed. Now, next one is a very good adjustment. There is an old machinery which got destroyed because of fire and there is a loss of 20 lakhs. So, first of all, add back this loss. This loss is not allowed as deduction. Now, you are also receiving some scrap on that machinery. That scrap also reduced from PGBP income. That is also not your income. You have to adjust that scrap in what? In the WDB of the block of asset. So, loss has to be added back and the scrap which you have received, which you have credited to the PNL, that has to be reduced and you have to adjust this 5 lakh from the WDB of the block of asset. In this question, WDB of the block of asset is not given. Next question is, you are receiving some dividend from foreign company of 
15 lakhs. So first of all, reduce this dividend from PGBP, show under IFOS. Okay, and you are incurring some expenses of 50,000 on that dividend. Assume that this, this expense is interest. If you assume this expense as interest, it is allowed as deduction because against the dividend, only interest expense is allowed to the extent of 20% of gross dividend. Apart from that, no other expense will be allowed as deduction. Okay, next one is you are earning some uh, same, same adjustment which we have been doing again and again. You are earning some profit from sale of land to your 100% subsidiary. Subsidiary is an Indian company, then it is exempt under section 47. Same adjustment is coming again and again. Next one is you have purchased some new plant and machinery in the last year. In the last year, you have purchased some new plant and machinery. So, in the last year, you have purchased and put to use on 10th of Jan. So, in the last year, you would have got additional depreciation half only. Okay. Now, you want the additional depreciation balance half in the current year, but in the current year, you cannot take. Why? Because in the current year, you are opting for 115 BAA. Therefore, you cannot take the balance depreciation in the current year. Okay. Similarly, in the last year, you have paid some amount to the contractor for repair of factory of around 7 lakh rupees. But you did not deduct the TDS and paid the TDS on time in the last year. So, in the current year, you are making the payment on time. So, you will get the deduction in the current year. So, in the current year, in the last year, 30% of 7 lakh would have been disallowed. But in the current year, 30% of 7 lakh will be allowed to you in the current year. So, you have to reduce this much amount. That is 30% of 7 lakh will come to 2.1 lakhs. You have to reduce from your net profit. Okay. And last but not least, whatever dividend you have earned over here of 15 lakhs minus 50,000, that is 14 lakh 50,000, that will be subject to what? Deduction under ATM and you have made the payment of dividend declared and distributed within one month before the due date of filing of return. So, whatever dividend you earn, if you make the payment of that dividend to your shareholder, if you declare and distribute that dividend to the shareholders within one month prior to the due date of filing of return, you will get the deduction of that dividend. So, you can take the deduction of this 20 lakhs or 14 lakh 50,000, whichever is lower. After doing that, you will compute the total income and then you will compute the tax. Tax will be very simple, 22% tax, 10% surcharge and 4% cess will be applicable as per 115 BAA. Okay. The next question is on real estate investment trust. There is a REIT and there is Hats Limited which is an SPV of the REIT and there is an investor Mr. Vijay who holds 70% of the units, 70% investment in the REIT is of one person only that is Mr. Vijay. Now we need to tell what is the treatment of each and every item. Okay, first the interest which is earned from SPV is exempt in the hands of REIT but it is taxable in the hands of the investor. How much will be taxable? 70% will be taxable and Mr. Uh, Vijay is also opting for what? 115 BAC. So you have to compute the tax of Mr. Vijay as per 115 BAC. Second thing is you are earning some dividend, you are earning some dividend from SPV. So it is always exempt in the hands of the REIT but in the hands of investor it depends if the SPV has opted for 115 BAA then it is taxable your SPV has opted for 115 BAA that is the reason it is taxable if SPV would have not opted for 115 BAA then it would have been exempt in the hands of investor also next short term capital gain on sale of property is taxable in the hands of REIT at 42.744 percent MMR exempt in the hands of investor similarly interest on unlisted debentures is taxable in the hands of the REIT at 42.744 percent exempt in the hands of investor and rental income from properties is exempt in the hands of REIT but taxable in the hands of investor and investor has to pay tax. Okay. Now, this is what this question is all about. Nothing great. Whenever investor is paying tax, you have to take 70% of that amount in the income of Mr. Vijay because Mr. Vijay only holds what? Only holds uh, 70%. Now, in the hands of REIT, there are only two incomes which are taxable. That is point number three and four. That will be taxable at 42.744. And in the hands of investor, you have to apply 115 BSC and then you check whether surcharge is applicable. Yes, it is applicable because if you compute the total income of the SSE, it is going beyond 10 lakhs, beyond 10 crore, sorry. Therefore, you have to apply what? Surcharge also of 37% in this particular question. The next question is also a very, very very good question. Now, what is happening in this question? There is a non-resident and a foreign company, Mr. X, who is appointing one agent in India. And what is the duty of that agent? That agent is habitually maintaining stock in India, is delivering the stock on behalf of the non-resident. The foreign company does not have a P in India. They don't have any branch office factory in India, but they have an agent in India who is habitually maintaining what he was habitually doing contracts on behalf of that particular entity, who is habitually maintaining, sorry, stocks in India, who is delivering stocks in India, that amounts to business connection. Therefore, whatever delivery he has made in India will be subject to business connection. Okay. So, we need to answer one by one. Income from delivery of goods done by Mr. Lal Singh. So, Lal Singh is what? An agent. He is deemed to, the, the income of the company, the non-resident will be deemed to accrue or rise in India as per 911. Okay. Now, second thing, Mr. Uh, this black and brown company is also earning from te technical services of 55 lakh rupees after deducting 6 lakh spent on earning the income. Now, here there are two views which are taken by SSE. First view which is taken by the institute is, uh, the first view which institute is taking is, it is assumed to be a normal technical service. It is not 115A service. Therefore, if it is normal service, then 40% tax will be chargeable on 55 lakh rupees. That is the net profit. But if we assume this to be a 115A, which is no, it doesn't make sense to assume, but institute has assumed that. The institute has assumed that. Why it doesn't make sense? Because there is no information in the question which says that there is an agreement, the agreement is approved. But still, if we assume that there is an agreement, it is approved, then you will not get the deduction of this 6 lakhs. Then your income will be 55 plus 6, that is 61 lakhs. And 61 lakhs will be subject to what? 10% tax. That is what the institute has made as an assumption. Then, unlisted debentures 
that in that long term capital gains will be subject to 10% tax under section 112 plus there is some 50% tax which is paid by bnb in country x will it get the benefit of tax credit in india obviously no the tax credit is given to residents bnb is not resident in india bnb cannot get the credit of the tax which is paid in foreign country it is not a resident in india therefore bnb will not get the benefit over here okay so this is what this question is all about we are supposed to follow what <coughs> We are supposed to compute tax payable also. So, tax payable will be very simple. 2 crore 75 lakhs. Uh, we want uh, this long term capital gains 10%, FTS 10%. And in some case, we can also assume that FTS is what? FTS is 40%. We can assume that also. Though, either of the way, the tax liability will change in both the cases. Okay. Now, coming to the next question, question number 3, part A, which is on trust. There is one trust, charitable trust, which is registered under 12AB. It is receiving a donation of 5 lakh rupees. Now, it is after receiving the donation of 5 lakh rupees, it says that because it is a corpus donation, it is exempt. No, no, no. It's not like that. A corpus donation is not by default exempt. It will be exempt only if you invest in the mode specified in 11.5. Therefore, they have to invest that in the mode spe specified in 11.5. They cannot directly claim exemption on corpus donation. So, if they do not invest, it is taxable. Okay. The second question, what does it say? In this question only, there is a second question. They have taken a loan of 20 lakh rupees and they have incurred that loan. They have used that loan to construct a building. Now, they are asking the deduction of this 18 lakhs. Not allowed, not allowed, not allowed. The loan which you have taken for construction, it will be not allowed when you use for construction. In fact, it will be allowed on the day on which you will use that loan to repay. You, you, you will repay the loan to the bank. Whenever you will repay the loan to the bank, at that time we are going to give you the deduction. Till that time we are not going to give you the deduction. Next question is there is some not for profit institutions which are receiving donation from public also and which are receiving donation from government grant also. So they are receiving there is some not for profit organization like school etc which is there. Some smile foundation which is a kind of school which is receiving donation from public also. Donation from government also. Now if it is substantially financed by government then the income is exempt. Okay. Now we need to find out how much the government has financed. What do I mean by substantial? Substantially finance. As per section 1023C, substantially finance means the government should finance more than 50%. Here, out of the total donation of 30 lakhs, 16 lakhs is given by government grant and 14 lakhs is given by public. Therefore, it is substantially financed by the government and therefore the income is exempt, exempt, exempt. They need not take any approval over here. Okay. Next question. Once as one assessee is there who is registered under 2LAB, now an assessee who is registered under 2LAB, that assessee wants to enjoy 1023 also. Can the assessee take the benefit of both the sections? No, no, no. As per section 11, subsection 7, the assessee has to take the benefit of either 12AB or 1023C 10, 10, or 1046, either of the two. It cannot take the benefit of both the sections at the same time. Okay. The next question is a very, very, very good question. Mr. Chetan is there whose age is 51 years. Now, in 2019, he left India. He left to, to uh, he left India to settle in country wide. So, before 2019, he was in India only. So, in 2019, he left because of some unavoidable reason. Now, he came back to India permanently in 2022. He is not coming to India for a visit. He is coming permanently in India in 2022. So, now, if he is coming in June 2022, so from June 2022 to March 2023, his number of days stay in India come to 304. So, he is definitely a resident. Second thing, is he ordinary resident? Yes, he is also ordinary resident. Why you are saying so confidently, sir? Because in 2019 only he left. So, if I take the last 10 years data, he will be definitely resident in 2 years. If I take the last 7 years data, he will definitely be staying in India for 7-30 days. Therefore, he is resident and ordinary resident. Now, for resident and ordinary resident, world income is taxable. Now, he is earning some property rent from country Y. From country Y, he is earning how much rent? 25,000 rent he is coming, earning. So, for that 25,000 rent, we are supposed to do what? We are supposed to, we are supposed to compute that 25,000 rent over here into 75. How am I taking 75? 75 I am taking, that is to convert the income from house property, I have to apply rule 115 and as per rule 115, income from house property, if I want to convert from foreign currency to Indian currency, I have to take TTBR as on the last day of the financial year. So, to convert this $25,000 rental income, I have to take TTBR as on the last day of the financial year, which is 75. So, therefore, this is $25,000 into 75, 1875, out of which I will get 30% standard deduction in India, I will take that, okay. Now, apart from that, he is also earning some business income from India, that is of 5 lakh rupees. So, if the business income is from India that will be directly taxable. Apart from that, he is also receiving some dividend of 1,25,000 from an Indian company. So, if an Indian company is giving you dividend and you are receiving a dividend from Indian company, then Indian company would have deducted TDS. So, you have to gross it up this. This has to be gross it up because this is received 138,889. 
and income from saving bank account which is 11500 which you are earning on that 10th on that you will get a deduction of 10000 rupees as standard deduction also on 80 tta now this will be your total income on that you will apply your tax as per the normal regime we are not following 115 bsc and all 115 bsc and all they have said not to follow now this is the tax which i am going to compute on my 19,52. Be very careful. Here the real, real journey starts of this question. On that you will apply 4% says and this is the tax liability which you are going to get. Now this divided by your total income, you will get what? You will get your average rate in India. Now, the, what is the average rate in foreign country? Now, the average rate in foreign country, if you directly see it is 20%, but that is wrong. That is not the average rate in foreign country. The reason is because 25,000 is your income in the foreign country. You do not pay tax on 25,000 in foreign country. You pay tax on minus 8,000 in foreign country. So you pay tax on only 17,000 in the foreign country. So, 20% is not charged on 25,000 because in foreign country, you pay tax on after taking exemption of $8,000. So, after taking exemption of $8,000, it comes to $17,000. So, you pay tax of only $3,400. So, $3,400 divided by your house property income, which is 25,000, it comes to 13.6% is your average rate. Your average rate is not 20%. This is a very, very important point. This is not your average rate. This 20% is not your average rate. 13.6% is your average rate. Okay. Because you are not paying 20% of 25,000. You are paying only 3,400 out of 25,000. Therefore, your average rate is tax divided by your total income. Your total income is how much? 25,000. Therefore, it comes to 13.6%. Therefore, you will take doubly tax income is how much? Doubly tax income is house property income is your doubly tax income. Rest of the income is are earned in India. 13,12,500 is your doubly tax income. On that, you will take 13.6%. That will come to 1,78 and that will be the relief under what? Under section 91. You can check it once if you want. Okay. Now, the next question is on TDS, 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 which is a very, very simple question. Nothing great as such. Okay. There is one person that is Mr. Rajat, who is aged 79 years and he is resident also and he is earning only saving bank interest, FD interest and pension income. Okay. Now, he does not offer 115 BSC also. So, for him section 194 P will be applicable because he is a specified senior citizen. Who is a specified senior citizen? Whose age is 75 years or more? Who is resident and who earns interest from bank and pension from the same bank? So, what will you do? Interest and this interest will be subject to 50,000 rupees. Both the interest taking together, you will get 80 TTB 50,000. And from pension, you will get what? 50,000 rupees standard deduction. And then compute the tax. That much tax the company has to what? The bank has to deduct in on your behalf. And once the bank deduct that much tax, then the SSC is not liable to file the income tax returns also. Next. There is an SSC who is giving his property to the some builder and the builder is making some payment. So, if I am giving my property to the builder and in return, the builder is giving me two things. He is giving me money also. He is going to give me flats also in future. He is going to give me a new house also in future in the new building. So, he will deduct TDS on what portion? As per section 194 IC, if I am seller, I am uh, if I am giving the property and if I am resident, then he will deduct TDS at the rate of 10% only on the cash portion. He will not deduct TDS on what? The property which he is giving me. He will deduct TDS only on the money which he is giving me. How much money he is giving me? He is giving me 6 crore rupees. So, on 6 crore rupees, he will deduct TDS at the rate of 10% on credit or payment, whichever is earlier. Okay. Next question. Mr. Aryan, Mr. Aryan, he is a, uh, a domestic company whose turnover of last year is what? Is, whose turnover of last year is more than 10 crore, crore rupees. Okay. <clears throat> now, his turnover of last year is more than 10 crore and he is purchasing goods of 85 lakh rupees. Okay. From Mr. Varun. So, now, on 25th of Jan. Now, this, the solution of this question is to be considered to be wrong because it is updated. This question was asked when this section came for the very first time. So, accordingly, there was some issue of dates. The section was applicable from 1st of July. So, accordingly, don't see the solution of this question. See the solution which I am showing you, which I am telling you that is the correct answer. Okay. Now, on 30 lakhs, I will not deduct TDS under 194Q. Why? Because TDS under 194Q is deducted when the payment exceeds 50 lakh rupees. So, first 30 lakhs, you will not deduct TDS. On the next 25 lakhs, yes, now the payment exceeds 50 lakhs. So, now how much it is exceeding? 5 lakhs it is exceeding. So, on 5 lakhs, you will deduct 1%. Now, on 20 lakhs, you will deduct again 1%. But later on, what happened? You returned 5 lakh rupees to the uh, 5, 5 lakh rupees goods to the seller and you took the refund also. So, there is a CBDD circular on that. I, as of now, I will deduct on 20 lakhs because when I am paying the amount, I did not know that I will return that particular goods later on because of some reason. So, now I will deduct TDS on 20 lakhs at the rate of 0.1%. It is not 1%, it is 0.1% everyone. Sorry. So, I will deduct TDS on 0.1% on 20 lakhs. Now, later on, I have taken the refund. So, I can adjust this 5 lakh rupees purchase against my future purchase. So, later on when I am purchasing goods of 10 lakh rupees, I will adjust that 5 lakh rupees ka purchase against this purchase. So, this 10 lakhs rupees will be subject to TDS at the rate of only 5 lakhs at the rate of 5% because 
the, the earlier TDS which I have paid on purchase return that can be adjusted against the same seller. Okay, so that I can do now. The next question is, there are two points in the next question. The state government of Telangana is giving you coal mine on lease. So if somebody is giving you coal mine on lease, then the person who is giving on lease, the coal mine or okay, parking lot or toll, etc. Then the person has to collect TCS at the rate of 2% under section 2061C. Now, the other transaction over here is the company to whom the coal mine is given the company is extracting the coal mine and selling the coals so if somebody is selling the coals then that company is liable to take what tcs at the rate of one percent on 206c subsection one now this question is exactly same what we have done in the previous paper also it is ics favorite question every time they are asking same question only of that cost plus method here i am not interested in doing that cost plus method again and again next question is there is a uh, Indian company SMT Limited and there is a foreign company Shine INC. Now that company is giving us some online advertisement services and that company does not have a permanent establishment and the Indian company has made a payment of 5 lakh rupees to the foreign company on 15th of March 2023 and they have deducted the equalization levy also. This is which equalization levy? This is 2016 equalization levy that Facebook wala equalization levy. Now if you have deducted the equalization levy on 15th of March, you should have paid by 7th of April. Now if you do not pay by 7th of April, you will be liable for interest at the rate of 1% for per month. So you are making a delay for how many months you are making a delay for part of the month part of the month is considered to be a complete month so you'll be liable for interest at the rate of one percent for one month on how much amount the payment which you are making is five lakhs on that six percent comes to thirty thousand thirty thousand is the equalization levy on that one percent that will come to three hundred rupees okay now the AO will also impose penalty on you AO will also impose penalty on you yes so what are the circumstances under which the penalty cannot be imposed if you prove to the AO that there was a reasonable cause for the delay if you go and prove to the AO that there was a reasonable cause for the delay in making the payment he will waive your penalty okay now if it does not waive your penalty and if you are aggrieved by the order of AO, what is the remedy available with you? You can go and file what? A CIT appeal within 30 days of the date of order of the assessing officer. You can go and file what? An appeal with the CIT appeal. So this is what this question is all about. And one last question over here is about what? It is about <coughs> whether a GAR will be, whether it is a tax planning or tax management or tax evasion. Let's see. There is an assessee who is making some payment of 10,000 rupees in Sukhanya Samriddhi scheme, ATC deduction. So it is tax planning. Okay. Now, there is an assessee who is a company and it is obtaining form 60 from the customers who don't who does not have PAN. So all the customers who do not have PAN, they are obtaining form 16. So form, form, uh, form 60. So this is the kind of compliance done by the company. So it is a tax management. Third one, the company is purchasing some of refrigerator and it is installed in, in the residence of the partners and but they are showing what? They are showing that it is in the office. So they are making a clear tax evasion case. You are buying a refrigerator in the name of the company and you are showing it in the books of the company but you are using at the home of the partner. It is not allowed. Similarly, last case, a company is making payment to Mrs. D, a wife of director. Why? Without any reason. She is just a housewife but you are making payment to the wife of director and you are claiming that expenditure. So it is again a case of what? Tax evasion. The last question is a theory question. You can go it once at your end if you want. So let's move on to this last paper that is of November 2022 and the next paper will be yours that is May 23 and November 23. Okay. So let's start with the first question over here. The first question is a company which is a resident in India but it is a closely held company in which public are not substantially interested. Because it is a closely held company, section 79 might apply, section 68 might apply, section 56.27b might apply, section 222e might apply. These are the provisions where uh, closely held company provisions are there. I have given a complete summary also in our color book. You can go and check after set of chapter. Okay. I have given a complete summary, complete summary in which all provisions closely held company sections are applicable. See the same thing is tested by ICI over here. The first point is debatable over here. You are purchase, you are doing the same adjustment which we have been doing again and again in the last 18 papers. So now, but here the ICI has assumed some vague assumptions over here. You are purchasing some uh, one-time franchise fees. What we have been doing so far, that is absolutely correct. You can reduce that much. You can add back 12 lakhs to your income statement, PGBP, and reduce 25% depreciation. Dep dep but your ICI has made an alternate assumption. What is that alternate assumption? Listen, please. They have added 12 lakhs, but they have said that we are not reducing 25% because we are assuming that the depreciation which is given below now, this 14 lakh 50,000 might include the depreciation of one-time franchise fee also. Then why you have not made this assumption in earlier questions also? So don't forget, forget about this assumption which is made by ICI. Follow the same thing which we have been doing so far. Even in this question, they have done both the things. First thing which we have done is add 12 lakhs less 25%. Second thing which they have done is add 12 lakhs, ignore. Do not reduce 25%. Next is, you are incurring some expenses on convertible debentures issue. That is allowed as a deduction, nothing wrong. Ha, if you incur expenses for issue of equity shares, then that is not allowed. That is considered to be a capital expenditure. That is not allowed. Now, the third adjustment is a very, very, very intelligent adjustment. Now, in third adjustment also, they have taken two views. Now, you are making some payment to share broker first and then you are making some payment to commodity broker. Now, they are made and you are not deducting the TDS. Okay. Now, the two assumptions which they have made, let me tell you one by one. The first assumption they have made is, assume that 
these are business expenses assume that the assessi is engaged in the trading of uh, shares and trading of commodity assume that now if i assume that then this 225000 will be allowed as deduction but you will ask that you will say that sir why tds is not deducted tds is not required to be deducted on commission etc paid to broker share broker tds is not required but if you make the payment to commodity broker, TDS is required. Go and check 194H. So what is the first assumption we are making? We are making an assumption that SSC is engaged in the business of trading in shares and trading in commodity. Therefore, these are business expenses. Now, if business expenses are there, it will be allowed. So in case of share broker, it will be allowed without deduction of TDS because TDS is not required in case of share broker. But in case of commodity broker, TDS is required. Therefore, 30% will be disallowed over here. Now, the second assumption will be that we assume that it is not a part of business. The trading is not a part of business. SSC is neither trading in share nor trading in commodity. In, both, in that case, you have to add back both the things the question of tds does not arise only okay the next question is also very very good question you are making some payment to contribution to approved pension scheme how much deduction is allowed to employer only 10 percent of salary salary means how much 10 percent of salary means which salary 10 percent of basic plus da in terms now how much is actually contributed by the employer actually the employer is contributing 15 percent of the basic salary it the, therefore the 15 percent of basic salary comes to 90 thousand but that is not allowed. How much is allowed? Only 10% of basic plus DA in terms. Now, how much is basic? Basic is 6 lakhs. How much is DA in terms? The DA, the total DA is 30% of basic. So, DA will come to 30% of 6 lakhs. That will come to 1.8 lakhs. Now, out of that, the DA in terms is only 50% of that. So, 50% of that will come to 90K. Therefore, DA in terms is only 90K. Therefore, basic plus DA in terms is 6 lakhs 90,000. 10% of that will come to 69,000. And therefore, 90,000 is the actual contribution allowed is 69,000. Therefore, 21,000 will be disallowed under the income tax law. I hope it is clear to everyone. Okay. Next you are making some payment you are a pharma company and therefore you are making some payment as freebie to medical practitioners not allowed not allowed not allowed not allowed even finance at 2022 has clarified that it is not allowed as a deduction then you are incurring some expenses as feasibility study on your existing business without creating any asset you are not creating any asset therefore it will be allowed as an expenditure because it is not a capital expenditure depreciation will be added back employees provident fund which is paid after 15 days will be disallowed and employer contribution which is paid till the due date of filing of return will be allowed okay there is no harm in that swaj bharat abhiyan you are making the payment to 2 lakh rupees add back in pgpp you can claim deduction under chapter 6 100 percent is allowed but you have to assume that it is other than cash if you assume that it is in cash it will not be allowed in chapter 6 next you are receiving some concession from what the central government or state government then that is considered as income under section 222 224 18 that also we have done a lot of time in the earlier questions okay now in the opening stock and in the closing stock, you are having some unnecessary interest. So, in the opening stock, you are having an interest of 6,85,000 unnecessarily. So, add back that because it is on the debit side. In the closing stock, you are having some unnecessary interest and borrowing cost of 5,65,000. So, it is on the credit side. So, reduce that. Remove that from what? From your PGPP income. Okay. Net profit from what? The profit from warehousing business. You have some warehouse of storage of sugar. You have you have purchased some warehouse for storage of sugar. And you are earning some profit of 10 lakh rupees from that. And how much you have made an investment? You have made an investment in the last adjustment. You can see 35 lakh out of which 20 lakhs is land so land will not be allowed as deduction but 15 lakhs will be allowed as deduction so how much is your profit profit is 10 lakhs and how much is your deduction 15 lakhs is your deduction so 5 lakh rupees loss cannot set off against your existing business because 35 80 loss will be set off only against 35 80 business till infinity you cannot set off as per section 73a the next adjustment is something which you have done earlier copy paste adjustment it is so see how the things are repeated from your past rtps and mock test papers lot of things gets repeated here 50 percent paper is repeated only first of all you have collected 14 lakhs as gst from customer and you have paid the gst before time so you collected 14 lakhs you paid 14 lakhs deduction will be allowed then you file the case in the honorable high court the high court directed to the government that refund 5 lakhs to the SSE. so you got 5 lakhs so now when you got the 5 lakhs you should give that back to the customers because gst money belongs to customer so you got 5 lakhs you gave 3 lakh to the customers okay so 3 lakh deduction will be allowed but 2 lakhs is still not given to the customer so you have to add back 2 lakhs similar adjustment we have done earlier don't worry now the next two adjustments are the reason why we are doing this question these are absolutely new adjustments so this is a closely held company as you can see in the very first line and if a closely held company is issuing shares at 22 rupees and if the fair market value is 19 rupees so if the closely held company is issuing shares at more than face value and more than fair market value of the shares then the difference between the difference between the actual sale price the actual issue price which is 22 and the fair market value which is 19 will be considered as income from other sources for the company therefore the other source for the company will come to how much 3 rupees per share the difference between the fmb and the actual actual issue price is 3 rupees into 2 lakh shares 6 lakhs rupees will be added to income from other source this is very 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 important adjustment it has never ever come earlier okay 
It is not that we have not done in class. We have done everything in class. Not a single adjustment will come from something which we have not done in class. Next one is you have some broad forward losses. Now, because it is a closely held company, do you remember that? If you have a loss in 1920 and if more than 51% of the shares are held by Mr. X, then Mr. X should be the shareholder today also. Now, Mr. X sold all his shares in the 2021. Now, because the year in which the loss was incurred and the year in which you want to set off the loss, 51% of the shareholders are not same, not same, not same. Therefore, you are not going to get the deduction of loss under this particular year as per section 79. Because section 79 clearly says, in case of a closely held company, the 51% of the shareholders in the year in which the loss was made and the year in which the loss you want to set off, it has to be same. On which date we are supposed to compare? On the last day of both the years. If it is not there, then you will not be allowed to carry forward and set off the loss. Then 14,50,000 you can reduce and then you will compute the total income. This is what this question is all about. It's a beautiful, beautiful question. Go through it once. Okay. So let's move on to this next question. This next question is on LLP and this is also on 10 AA and there are multiple implications in this. So always remember whenever there is a question on partnership firm and NLP, first thing which you have to find out is the book profit, book profit, book profit. Okay. Now this company, this LLP is having a net profit of 65 lakhs. First of all, we'll compute the book profit of the firm. What is book profit? Book profit as per 40B. Book profit is nothing but PGPP income only, but just add the remuneration which is debited to PNL. So first of all, let's compute book profit. The book profit, first of all, is profit on sale of import license. This is the part of PGPP section 28. It is chargeable. Therefore, ignore this. Okay. Then remuneration paid to working partners add back. We need to compute book profit. Then interest of 20 lakhs, which is 16%. So add back 4%. 4% you have to add it back. Then donation to political party 3 lakh rupees. You have to add back this donation and then you have to you can reduce that later on. What in chapter 6 say while computing the total income? Assume that it is other than cash, other than cash, other than cash. Then you add back depreciation of 17 lakh rupees. You can add back. Okay. Now after you do all these things, whether while computing the book profit you will adjust broad fraud loss? No, no, no. Broad fraud loss does not come under section 28 to 43 whatever comes under section 28 to 43 you have to adjust that so you will adjust this later on while computing the total income not now next 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 unabsorbed depreciation whether you will compute the unabsorbed depreciation while computing what while computing the uh, book profit yes unabsorbed depreciation will be reduced while computing the book profit because it comes under section 28 to 43 once you do that you will do get what you will get your book profit once you get the book profit you will compute your remuneration which is up to 3 lakhs 90 percent above 3 lakhs it is what 60 percent of book profit and then you will compare with your actual remuneration check it please and then whichever is lower will be allowed as remuneration to you as per the provisions of 40B. Now, once this is computed, what you will do? After that, the real challenge will start. After that, you will reduce what? Uh, your Once your book profit is computed, your remuneration is computed, then you will reduce what? Your broad loss also will be reduced because we need to also compute our total income. Once total income is computed, now we are supposed to compute the deduction under what? Under uh, the provisions of uh, 10 AA. So, how the deduction will be allowed under 10 AA? How much deduction is allowed under 10 AA? It is the profit from export multiply by export turnover divided by total turnover. So, first of all, let me speak about the export turnover. How to compute the export turnover? Now, export turnover will only include that turnover which is brought to India. So, how much is brought to India? 38 crore is brought to India. In that also, there are some charges which are included. That should not be included in export turnover. Export turnover only includes what? Only includes FOB price. It does not include insurance, freight and other charges. Therefore, export turnover will come to how much? The amount which is realized, that is 38 lakhs. Out of that, these charges also should be removed. Therefore, the export turnover will come to how much? Only 36 crores. What is the total turnover? Total turnover is 45 crore. Now, out of 45 crores, in that 45 crore also, in total turnover also, you should not take some other charges like insurance, freight and other charges. That also should be removed. Therefore, the total turnover is how much? 40 crore. Now, what is your profit? Now, for profit, Institute has taken two views. Now, the first view, which is taken by Institute for Computing Profit, be very careful now. Your gross total income is 29,90,000. Okay. Now, out of this, you are supposed to first of all remove what? You are supposed to remove first of all what? 9 lakh rupees profit on sale of import entitlement license. Because profit on sale of import entitlement license are not eligible for 10 double deductions. Therefore, remove that. Remove that much from 29,90,000. So, if I remove 29,90,000 minus what? Minus 9 lakhs, it comes to what? It comes to 20 lakh 90,000 rupees. So, that is the one way in which I can solve the question. Institute has done another way of solving the question. Institute has said what? You should not take the profit after loss because we should take the profit before loss over here. Why you are taking the profit after deducting the, deducting the loss? So, if you take the profit before loss, then you have to remove 9 lakh from 3390. And if you remove 9 lakh from 3390, then it will become 24 lakh 90,000. So, 24 lakh 90,000 is also correct and 20 lakh 90,000 is also correct. How I got? In one case, you are going to remove 9 lakh from after after the loss wala profit and in another case you are going to remove 9 lakh from before the loss wala profit in either of the case the answers will change definitely but your answers 
will be uh, your answers will be what these are the two different opinions which the ICI has given over here you can check over here okay now after you are done with all these things you are going to compute the AMT now AMT is very simple whatever is your total income you have to add back in the total income you have to add back the deduction and once you take the deduction after that you will compute the alternate minimum tax 18 and a half percent 4 percent says etc etc surcharge is not applicable and therefore you will compute the tax in a normal way it's a very simple part so the most important part of this question was then how to compute the profit and to compute the profit there are two views which are taken by the institute over here you can check it once okay so let's move on to the next question this is also a beautiful question mr uh, robert is there who is a non resident and he, he is a citizen of germany mr robert a non resident citizen of germany he is working for a german company now that company has a p in india and that company has sent robert to india for some work some official work in india and he is staying in india for 85 days and he is earning 28 lakh rupees and which is borne by indian p the first question is whether this income will be exempt or taxable in the hands of mr robert okay now mr robert is staying in india for only what for only 85 days therefore he is definitely non resident okay but his income cannot be exempt under section 10-6. Why? 10-6 is applicable if the non-resident employee comes to India for up to 90 days. So, he is staying for up to 90 days. He is not crossing the 90 days barrier. But the second thing is that company which is there outside India, that should not have any trade or business in India. Now, that company, German company is having a P in India and they are doing a business in India. Therefore, he will not get the benefit of exemption. The employee will not get the benefit of exemption under section 10-6. Therefore, this 28 lakhs will be subject to tax. 50,000 standard deduction also he can claim. There is no harm in that. Okay. Second thing, second income which Mr. Robert is doing over here is Robert is also purchasing some shares of private limited company in 2015 he has purchased by remitting foreign currency. So, here if a non-resident purchases shares of Indian company in foreign currency, then first provisor to 48 will apply. Accordingly, you will convert the uh, all the prices into dollars first and then you will reconvert into rupees. At what rate? The sale consideration will be converted as per TTBR on the date of sale. So, the TTBR on the date of sale is this. The purchase consideration, the cost will be converted as per the TTBR on the date of purchase. Average, average. You have to take average at both the cases. So, the date of purchase is this. So, you will convert cost of acquisition as per this rate. Once you convert the sale and cost, expenses on transfer is not given in the question. So, forget about that. You will get the capital gains in foreign currency. So, you have to reconvert that capital gains into INR. When you reconvert, you will take only TTBR, only TTBR, only TTBR, on the date of purchase okay on the date of sale sorry ttbr on the date of sale you will get your capital gains you can make the calculation okay now the third income which is earned by him is a very very intelligent income he has purchased he has some he has some uh, he has purchased some shares of some company by the name called as ag limited ag ag is having a total assets of 15 lakhs and the ag is having an assets in india of 8 crore rupees okay 15 crore 8 crore now the income of the shares of ag does not derive its value substantially from asset located in india why because if you want to say that any foreign company shares like cgp vodafone case law this question is on if any foreign company shares derive its value substantially from asset located in india then that foreign company's assets in india should be at least of 10 crore rupees if the assets is of 10 crore rupees and if it is if it is having at least 50 percent of total assets in india then only they are going to get the, the tag of what the shares of foreign company derive its value from asset located in india now the shares of this company in the assets of this company in india is only of how much rupees is only of 8 crore rupees now because it is only 8 crore it is less than 10 crore the shares of the foreign company does not derive its value from india therefore it is what therefore it is not taxable in india this particular transaction is not taxable in india with the shares which is selling of what ag limited to another non-resident mr david will not be taxable in india because the shares of ag does not derive its value substantially from asset located in india to understand this provision go and read pro the provision of what capital gains properly sorry the provisions of board of case law properly you have to see that particular chapter properly last but not least he has also received some dividend in india so if a non-resident receives something in india then it is definitely taxable in india and that will be subject to tax in india you can check the solution over here okay now let me move on to the next question the next question is on charitable purpose the assasi is a charitable foundation which is engaged in promotion of yoga so now we all know that yoga is what yoga is covered in one of the charitable purpose definition under section 2 clause 15 okay now this assasi is doing two things it this assasi is receiving some corpus donation of 125 lakhs okay now corpus donation should be invested in the mode specified in 115 now this assasi is investing in a shares of private company so if you receive corpus donation and invest in the shares of private company it is not a specified mode therefore you will not get the exemption this will be subject to tax okay now this trust is also receiving what it is also receiving some amount from what as a voluntary donation now this voluntary donation will be subject to 15 percent exemption it is also receiving some free from the uh, fee from the students for teaching yoga so if you are teaching yoga you are receiving some fees that is also subject to exemptions under what section 11 1 you can claim 15 percent exemption because promotion of yoga is considered to be a charitable purpose okay now the next one the answer will change because of finance act 2022 amendment there was a person who 
वॉज अ फाउंडर ऑफ अ ट्रस्ट नाउ हिस्स सन बिकेम इल सो द फादर एडमिटेड हिस्स सन इन द हॉस्पिटल ऑफ द ट्रस्ट ओके नाउ द टोटल फी विच वॉज चार्ज टू हिम वॉज थ्री लैक्स अदरवाइज इट शुड बीन चार्ज एट द रेट ऑफ फाइव लैक्स सो यू आर गिविंग अनइंटेंडेड बेनिफिट टू वॉट टू द रिलेटेड पार्टी टू द स्पेसिफाइड पर्सन अंडर सेक्शन थर्टीन सब सेक्शन थ्री सर इज द सन ऑफ अ ट्रस्टी स्पेसिफाइड पर्सन ये गो एंड चेक सेक्शन थर्टीन सब सेक्शन थ्री सन ऑफ अ ट्रस्टी रिलेटिव ऑफ अ ट्रस्टी स्पेसिफाइड पर्सन सो इन दैट केस द ट्रस्ट विल बी लाइबल फॉर लॉट ऑफ न्यू प्रोविजन विच आर ब्रॉड बाई फाइनेंस एक्ट टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी टू द ट्रस्ट विल बी लाइबल फॉर अ पेनाल्टी ऑफ वॉट पेनाल्टी अंडर सेक्शन टू सेवेंटी वन एफ हंड्रेड पर्सेंट इन द फर्स्ट केस एंड इन सब्सिक्वेंट केस इट इज टू हंड्रेड पर्सेंट द ट्रस्ट विल ऑल्सो लाइबल फॉर टैक्स एट द रेट ऑफ थर्टी परसेंट फॉर गिविंग अनइंटेंडेड बेनिफिट टू द स्पेसिफाइड पर्सन receiver will also be liable for what gift taxation under the income tax provision 56 to 10 so the answer will drastically change don't see the answer given over here because this is as per finance act 2021 because this is the latest paper and i have did not get the time to change the entire solution over here okay i have directly put the ici booklet over here so don't see this okay so whatever answer which i have told you that is the correct answer now the next question this is also a very very intelligent question mr ritesh who is an individual whose age it age is 42 years okay now he is an individual he is resident his age is 42 years now there are lot of small small things over here he is earning some business from india so that will be taxable he is liable to pay tax on that particular income now he is not opting for 115 bsc so compute tax as per the normal provision second mr ritesh is also earning some royalty from country n now from country n whatever royalty is earning na that will not be taxable in india because it is written between dt double between india and country n that royalty will be taxable in the source state now which is source state is india source state no the source state is country n therefore it is taxable in country n so this particular amount 7 lakh 80 is not taxable in india now the third one is it is written that for interest With, for interest in from country by for that it is written in dtaa that it is it is taxable in both the countries and india will give credit to that particular person okay now for in that case over here we have to suppose to compute this particular thing in india because this is taxable in india and it is taxable in foreign country also and then dtaa relief can be given to the assessee but it is taxable in india in the first hand this above point was not taxable only in india now how to compute this income let us assume that it is interest other than security if it is interest other than security na then you have to take ttbr as on the last day but if it is interest on security na then you have to take ttbr as on the preceding last day of the preceding month so this is the difference between taking the ttbr when you want to convert an interest other than security into inr you have to take the ttbr of the last day ttbr of the last day is 80 rupees uh, sorry ttbr of the last day is what it is uh, it is 80 rupees you have to take that 80 rupees as ttbr of the last day but when you want to convert the interest interest on security you have to take the ttbr of the last month of the last day of the preceding month so we are assuming that it is an interest other than security so we'll take ttbr on the last day okay once we do that after that agriculture income in country m that will be taxable because agriculture income is taxable in both the countries okay country m whatever you are doing that will be taxable in india and in country m it is exempt not not in not in india in country m it is exempt okay now therefore 4 lakh 85000 rupees is the business income royalty because in country m it is taxable you will not take and this you will convert 9000 500 in as per ttbrs of the last date as per rule 115 and after doing all these things and you will take aggregation come from country m okay after doing all these things you will apply the normal tax rate 115 bsc should not be followed now let us come to relief will i going is am i going to get the relief on aggregation come no 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 because aggregation income is exempt in country m because if something is exempt in foreign country that income is not doubly taxed na and if that income is not doubly taxed how can you ask you relief on that particular income yes you will get relief on interest so how much relief you will get on interest first of all find out the average rate in india the average rate in india is very simple it is nothing but 227 divided by 1354 that will be the average rate in india that is 16.78 now we need to find out the average rate in the foreign country what is the average rate in the foreign country how much tax you have paid in the foreign country you have paid 950 dollars in the foreign country on 21st of feb 2022 it is was deducted so how to convert the tax there are two different rules ha huh? 115 is to convert foreign income into indian income and 128 is to convert foreign tax into indian tax so how to convert this tax this tax has to be converted as per ttbr as on the last day of the preceding month So what is the TTBR as the last day of the preceding month? This was deducted in February. Therefore, the last day of the preceding month comes to which month? It comes to February. It comes to January. Uh, January thirty first. So you have to convert this nine fifty as per Jan thirty first. Okay. So that's what it is done over here. Nine fifty into seventy eight, and this is seventy four one hundred. Okay. Now we need to compute whichever is lower. How much is the double tax income? Seven lakh sixty thousand is the double tax income. And what is the average rate in India? Sixteen point seven nine eight. So according to that, the tax in India on the foreign income comes to how much? One twenty seven six six five. I am again saying the tax in India. On foreign income comes to how much? One twenty-seven six six five. And the tax in uh, tax in foreign country on foreign income comes to how much? Seventy-four one hundred. And you can take the relief of seventy-four one hundred over here. It's a beautiful question. Just go through it once. It's a very 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 good and important question for your exam. Okay. Now the next one. <coughs> Now the next question is on TDS whether TDS will be deducted or not in the following cases. Now this assessor is purchasing some computer software for the purpose of reselling and for to the users in India. So if you purchase any software for reselling 
as a distributor you are purchasing and then reselling then the tds is not applicable because it is not a royalty only it is not considered to be a royalty as per the supreme court judgment of An analysis engineering excellence there is a long judgment it is not a royalty and if it is not royalty tds provisions will not be applicable okay second one there is a public sector company who is making some payment to the bank as commission for facilitating atm cards or debit cards whether TDS is applicable, the court has said that even CBDD has said that TDS will not be applicable in such transaction. Neither 194H will be applicable because the relationship between both of them is not of principal and agent relationship. The relationship between both of them is principal and principal relationship. Therefore, 194H commission will not be applicable. Even 194J will not be applicable because then there is no manual or human intervention for 194J to applicable to be calling anything as a professional service. You need there need to be some kind of manual or human intervention. Otherwise, 194J cannot be made applicable. Therefore, TDS is not applicable in this case. Now, there is one person PQR who has given a contract to Mr. Pei to Mr. A who is a Pei. Okay, to Mr. A who is a Pei, he has given a contract to make some shirts. Now, Mr. A has asked for it. Mr. A has asked to PQR that. Who is going to give me the cloth? So, Mr. PQR says that my related party is going to give you cloth. So, related party is going to give you the cloth. So, if a cloth is received from the assessee, that is from the customer or from its related party, both, both of them are covered from its associate entity, then in that case, TDS provisions will be applicable. Now, that depends upon whether the other person, now, it's very simple. I am telling you to make a shirt. Now, you will ask me who will give me the cloth. Cloth can be given by either me or it can be given by my related party or it can be given by third party also. If it is purchased from third party, then it is a pure sale. But if it is purchased from me or it is purchased from my related party, then you I am liable to deduct TDS. Now, it depends upon because in that case, we are giving you the cloth. If I am giving you the cloth or my related party is giving you cloth, it is one and the same thing only. Okay. So, in that case, you are not giving me sale. You are not doing sale to me. You are giving only services to me. So, you, I will deduct TDS. But in this case, I have, you have to be very remember. You have to remember one thing that you cannot issue an invoice on a consolidated basis. If you issue invoice on a consolidated basis, which you are doing over here, I will deduct TDS on the entire amount. If you give a breakup that this is, is for service, this much is for, is for product, is for goods, then I will deduct TDS only on the service portion. But you are making a mistake. You are giving me a consolidated invoice. Therefore, I will deduct TDS on the entire portion. Okay. Next one, there is a non-resident who is not a citizen of India. So, if a non-resident who is not a citizen of India and who comes to India to participate in matches, etc., then 20.8% TDS will be deducted under 194E. Similarly, if they write any article in a sports magazine, that will also be subject to TDS at the rate of what? 20.8%. Okay. So, that is the provisions of 115 BBA, read with section 194E. Okay. Now, the next question is a very, very, very good question on cost plus method. Give a five star to this question. It's a different kind of question, different kind of question. You have not seen such kind of question ever so far. So, there is one company, MNO Limited, and there is one company, MNO INC. Both of them are holding subsidiary. Therefore, MNO and MNO are deemed to be associate enterprise. Both of them are associate enterprise. Now, we are supposed to follow cost plus method and we are supposed to find out the arm's length price. Now, what happens in cost plus method? In cost plus method, so first of all, you need to find out the cost of that service which you are providing direct and indirect cost, all the cost which you are providing to your associate enterprise. Then you are supposed to find out the GP margin of third party. But unfortunately, in this question, GP margin of third party is not given. So, what we are going to do? We are going to solve the question step by step. First of all, what are we going to do? We are going to find out the GP margin of unrelated party. Okay. For that, we need what? We need the cost of unrelated party which is given. Direct cost is 120 into 8 hours into for 18 days and indirect cost is 210 hours, 8 hours, uh, 210 USD into 8 hours for 18 days. Okay. I am computing in USD then we can convert in rupees later on. Okay. That this is the billing per month. This is the direct and indirect cost. Okay. Now, there is a mistake done by ICI. They should not have computed this. There is one more cost which is involved over here which is warranty which we are giving to third party. We are giving 1.5% of the direct cost as warranty. So, 1.5% of direct cost as warranty which is 17,280. So, that should also be added to the cost. So, my total cost comes to 47,779 and my billing to HYT becomes to how much? It is 92,000 which is given in the question. You can see over here how much is the billing to HYT unrelated party? It is 92,000. Be very careful. So, the differential between the two is 44,000. Therefore, what is my cost? GP to cost? My GP is 44,000. My cost is 47,000. My GP to cost is 92.5%. Okay. Now, I will go to my associate entity. My associate entity, I, pro, I charge them 120 rupees, 120 dollars. I give them service for 9 hours for 18 days and indirect cost 210 dollars, 9 hours for 18 days. Okay. Apart from that, I also take some loan from my associate entity. So, if I take some loan from my associate entity, then I am also liable for some interest payment that also I have to add in the cost. So, 1,20,000 dollars into 4% into 1 by 12 because all this billing is only for a month. It's a monthly calculation and this is my total cost. And now, on that total cost, I will apply my arm's length margin and I will get what? I will get my arm's length price. Check please. This is what you are supposed to do. First, compute the arm's length price. First, come find out the GP margin of third party and then apply that GP margin on your cost. You will get what? Your arm's length price. Okay. Then next question is based on case law. The very first case law is on Pepsi Foods Limited, which says that ITAT has the power 
and that has the power to give you a stay but can it be extended beyond 365 days yes it can be extended beyond 365 days but the income tax department says that it cannot be extended beyond 365 days even if the delay is not because of assessi even if the delay is because of tribunal law beyond 365 days it cannot be extended so the supreme court came for the favor of the assessi for the favor of the assessi supreme court gave this judgment and said that up to 365 days, the ITAT can extend the stay. But if beyond 365 days, it is not the mistake of the SSE, but it is the mistake of the ITAT, they are not able to close the matter, then they can also extend the stay beyond 365 days. It can be extended beyond 365 days if the delay is attributable to the ITAT. Yes, if the delay is attributable to the SSE, then it cannot be extended beyond what? Beyond 365 days. Now, the next question is also a good question, which is on search and seizure. Now, on 31st of December, a search conducted on the SSE and there was some gold bars which was seized from the assessee's locker. Now, assessee after that voluntarily disclosed 12.5 crores in the course of search. Okay. Now, later on what the assessee is saying, you know, this, later on assessee is filing an application and saying that whatever my tax liability might come in future, please adjust that much amount from this, uh, this uh, from my log, from my gold bar and give me the remaining gold bar. Can department do so? Suppose, for example, again, I'm saying today's search is happening. They are searching, they are, they are seizing something from you and can you tell to the department that give me uh, whatever future liability will come, re reduce that much amount from my gold bar and give me the remaining gold bar. That cannot be done. That can be done only under certain circumstances which are given under provider to section 132B, which says that if search is happening in this month, then the SSE can go within 30 days from the end of this month and tell the department that this is the nature of, and the source of the assets from this is the place from where I've got the gold bar. This is the place from where I've got the gold bar. This is the source of the gold bar. This is the nature of gold bar and it can be adjusted against the existing liability it cannot be adjusted against the future liability it cannot be adjusted before what the assessment is completed the SSC is insisting that complete that automatic tax liability might come now uh, if you are doing assessment some tax liability might come in future so adjust that again against that and give me that money the department said that not possible it can only be adjusted against the existing liability of the income tax law which was it cannot be adjusted against the future liability which might come in future on completion of assessment okay once the assessment is completed and if there is something left after that we will definitely return you don't worry now the next question is what is an irrelevant question in today's time. Sir, why it is irrelevant? Let me tell you. Do you remember that? If there is an outstanding interest in my balance sheet and I convert that outstanding interest into a new loan, that is not allowed as a deduction. Okay, that is not allowed as a deduction. But if there is an outstanding interest and if I convert that into a new debenture, that was allowed as deduction as per the Supreme Court judgment. That is what it is written over here. And that is what is an amendment made by Finance Act 2022, if you remember. Conversion of outstanding interest into a new debenture or any other security shall also not be amounting to deemed payment. It cannot be called as a deemed payment. It cannot be called as a deemed payment. So this is what this case law was all about. Now this case law is overridden, so it doesn't make any sense now to talk about this case law. Now the next question is, if there is an uh, order which is part by Board of, Board of Advance ruling, can you file an appeal against that? Yes, you can file an appeal against that to High Court within 16 days, within, within 60 days. If there is an Indian public sector company, it wants to go to Advance ruling, Board for Advance ruling, but it has a concern that their case is already pending before I died. Can they go to Advance ruling? Yes, they can go. If there is an, a public sector for public sector company, they can go to Advance ruling, even if their case is pending before I died, and Income Tax Authority, they can go for Advance ruling. Yes. But if their case is pending in front of what High Court and Supreme Court, then they are not allowed to go to what? Then they are not allowed to go to the adv advance holding. The case should not be pending in front of High Court and Supreme Court. It can be pending in front of High Court. The next question is a very simple question on equalization levy. You can see we have seen a lot of times such questions in the past exam papers. Okay. And one last question is there. That's it from my side. I will complete all the discussions which I was supposed to be doing with you all in South India for South India students in English. Now, whether GAR will be applicable in the following cases. First case, there is a company which is making losses. It is acquired by another company so that the loss can be set off. Whether GAR can be made applicable? Why GAR will be applicable in this case? It is allowed to do amalgamation. Yeah, there is nothing wrong in this. Amalgamation is allowed by the Income Tax Act. Amalgamation is also approved by the court. Therefore, there is no need to apply what GAR in this case. Second case, this company has purchased some listed shares in 2016 and then it got some bonus shares in 2021. Whether GAR will be applicable? They were doing this all with an intention to evade some tax. Whether GAR will be applicable? No, 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 no. Why? Because the GAR is applicable from 1-4-2017. So if any transaction is done if impermissible avoidance arrangement is done on or after 14 2017 then gar is applicable because this is done before 14 2017 gar is not applicable now because gar is not applicable on original shares gar cannot be made applicable on bonus shares also okay next one 
there is one indian company which wanted to give loan to another indian company but rather than doing that they are forming a company in a tax free tax low tax jurisdiction and they are purchasing equity shares of that company and then that third company is giving loan to the third second company so whether gar will be applicable yes it's a classic case of impermissible avoidance arrangement to evade tax gar will be applicable in this case and the fourth company is what it is setting up some unit in scz whether gar will be applicable no it is allowed it's tax planning it's not even tax evasion forget about tax avoidance it's a tax planning case it will be allowed as a deduction and one last question over here is there is one person who is a non resident mr albert we wants to treat the following person as his agent now who can be called as an agent first of all you need to understand who can be called as an agent in india an agent in india can be any person who is employed in india on behalf of non resident is an agent second any person who has acquired a capital asset any person whether resident or non resident has who has acquired a capital asset by transfer from non resident so in first case mr albert who is owning a house in india is selling his uh, house to another non resident so th and that mr de souza can be called as what as an agent because any person who has an acquired who has acquired a capital asset in india can be called as an agent whether that person who is acquiring is a resident non resident doesn't matter check the solution second case mr albert has employed mr rakesh can mr rakesh be called as an agent no 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 why no because mr rakesh is not in india in the current year for you to be employed in india then you need to be also in india an employee also need to be in india to become what an agent so mr rakesh cannot be called as what an agent in india that's it the next three questions are theory question you can go through it once if you want all of them are theory question based on last few topics which we have done in our ca final syllabus so that's it from my side whatever i could have done from my side i have successfully revised with you all 19 papers Six RTPs, eight mock test papers, and five exam papers. That too. In English. I cannot imagine I have done that. It was easy for me to do it in Hindi. <laughs> but it was absolutely painful for me to do it in English. That too in such a short span of time. In an average of around 15 minutes, I have tried to complete one paper. Whereby if you sit at your end, you will give at least 30 minutes to solve even one PGPP question at your end. Forget about entire paper. If you sit at your end, you will not be able to solve one PGPP question also. In 30 minutes, we have tried to complete entire one paper in 15 minutes like that. We have completed 19 papers. Whatever was there on ICI's website, we have done everything. Now let ICI ask whatever they want to. Believe me, if you are thorough with these 19 papers now, nobody can touch your hand in direct tax papers. Everything will be some or the other way related to these concepts. I'm not saying exactly it will be same, but some or the other way. And your mind is open like anything. Your mind is now started to thinking now. If this has come, this is going to be the effect. If this comes, this is going to be the effect. Now, I just request you all to share this lecture to as many people as you can in the entire South India. Because I know that in South India, there is nobody is recording all these things. I don't think so. Anybody has recorded these things in North India also for CFI under attack. But I am requesting you all to South India because on your request, I am recording all these things. Otherwise, till last year, I used to not do anything for English students. But now, I try to do everything parallelly for you all also. So if you have liked the lecture, share it with your friends. Maximum people you should share it. And if you have liked the lecture, you can have a view on the comment box below that what is your what is your opinion and what is your view on these beautiful sessions which I have tried to do from my side. So take care all of you. God bless you all. All the best for your exams. And whenever you will clear your exam, just remember this person for a second and just message me. At, I don't want anything from you. I just want a message from you that, sir, I have cleared my exams. That's it. I don't want anything from you. Okay. So take care all of you. Bye. Hope to see you soon. Bye.